East Bay Regional Park District on Thursday, November 10, 2022, and we're starting at 12.34 p.m. And I'll ask our recording secretary, Monica, to take the roll call. Thank you. President Coffey? Present. Director Rosario? Here. And Director Waspy filling in for Director Lane? Here. And I also wanted to go ahead and announce the staff here present. Thank you. We have GM Sabrina Landra, Dr. Ana Alvarez, Jim O'Connor, Lynn Burrell. We also have Kim Tai, Sean Dugan, Rachel Sater, Brian Holt, Lisa Gorgian, Chief Chirbro. That's it. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. Thank you all. And uh, Monica, could you please describe the uh, access issues with the Brown Act? Yes, today's meeting is held pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by AB 361. Board members and staff may participate via phone or video conferencing and or through a hybrid of in-person and remote attendance. We're providing live audio and video streaming. Members of the public wishing to make a public comment can do so by one via Zoom, two, submitting an email, or three, leaving a voicemail. This information is noted on the agenda. If there are no questions about the meeting procedures, we will begin. Thank you. And if any of our public have input into how to make access to the meeting easier on uh, our printed agenda, please let us know. So we'll move to the second item on the, the agenda, Southern Los Trampas Land Use Plan Amendment, Kim Tai. Good afternoon, President Coffey uh, and members of the Board Executive Committee. Kim Tai, Senior Planner with the Planning, Trails, and GIS Department. I'm happy to be bringing this item to you today. This is the Southern Los Trumpas land Draft Land Use Plan Amendment. Thank you. And Draft Environmental Impact Report, or uh, EIR, to you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'll be going over with you today some of the project background and, and give some context, as well as provide the recommendations from the land use plan amendment and going over the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA uh, process, and then reiterate the recommendation to the board executive committee, which is to forward to the full board of directors, um, a recommendation to adopt the land use plan amendment and certify the draft environmental impact report. Uh, to give an overview of the project location, this is in the southern portion of Las Trampas, outlined in yellow below, surrounded by the town of Danville, city of San Ramon, and unincorporated Contra Costa County. Before going into the, the park district's history of the project area, I wanted to give the full uh, history of this area, um, going back as far back as 13 million years ago. Um, <laughs> There were large predators and mastodons and ancient animals, um, such as the gomphotherium, an ancient elephant, and also such as this picture, the saber-toothed cats roaming in the area. And then fast forward to kind of 8,000 to 3,000 years ago, uh, there were foragers and hunter-gatherers, as outlined in our land use plan amendment. Um, they kind of roamed, uh, went through uh, all of San Francisco Bay Area, including the project area. And I do want to acknowledge the indigenous history of our project area. It's part of the Bay Miwok uh, language speaking Tatcan territory. Um, in, pictured here is a marker located in the Alamo area, um, acknowledging the Catan, Tat, Catan people. Uh, they were identified to have held the areas west of Mount Diablo, um, including Las Trampas Ridge, San Ramon Creek, Bollinger Creek, 
uh, and Los, uh, Las Trompas Ridge. So it does include the project area. Um, then in 1772, when the Spanish came uh, and established missions, Mission San Jose, which is now in Fremont, um, used this project area for cattle grazing and sheep grazing. Uh, following that in 1821, um, the project area was part of what's known as the Rancho San Ramon. And, and at this time, at that time, it was still heavily used for cattle ranching. Um, pictured here is an example in uh, as part of the Wiedemann Ranch when they were did when they were doing the cattle ranching. Uh, from the 1900s to today, cattle ranching continued, um, but San Ramon Valley was also prominently known for orchards, including uh, Bartlett pears, as seen here in this advertisement. Uh, then that slowly gave way to uh, residential development, which is the predominant uh, land use currently today. Now, in terms of the history of the park district's uh, uh, history of this project area, it actually only spans 40 years rather than the 13 million years of the, the area. Um, so beginning in 1983, 40 years, almost 40 years ago, uh, the park district acquired the 58-acre Peters Ranch property as a condition of approval for residential development just to the east of that green uh, parcel there. Uh, it's currently in Land Bank, and um, at the time it was discontinuous from the larger Las Trompas. But as stated in the 1993 land use development plan for Las Trompas, the goal for that parcel was to eventually connect to the larger Las Trompas and uh, connect to the Calaveras Ridge Trail. In 2007, the Park District acquired, acquired the two, uh, 228 acre Chen property in fee. At the time, the previous park property owners of the Chen property had proposed uh, residential development in that area, but instead the park district acquired and purchased this property with the goal of um, providing a staging area on the property as kind of a Southern gateway into Las Trompas um, and trail up to Las Trompas Ridge. And so in doing so, the park district has been able to kind of maintain the semi-rural character of this property um, kind of consistent with that area. In 2015, we acquired the Elworthy property uh, as a condition of approval for residential development. Um, along with that development, um, a staging area, a 12-car staging area was developed, as well as trail from that staging area up to Las Trompas Ridge. That staging area and trail are already open to the public, so uh, people can now go onto the staging area and get onto Las Trompas Ridge. In 2015, we acquired the Padva property, about 96 acres, um, as a condition of approval for residential development called the Red Hawk. And that one included, excuse me, um, a walk-in entrance, uh, and from the walk-in entrance, a trail into uh, an existing park, uh, the existing trail network in Las Trompas. Um, so the trail and walk-in entrance, which has on-street parking, have already been covered under the CEQA uh, as part of that residential development. So this land use plan amendment would be uh, to recommend that it uh, be open to the public. And finally, we are anticipating that the 141-acre Faria open space property uh, at the southern portion here will be anticipated to be uh, coming to the park district. Um, actually as a condition of a settlement agreement um, between the city of San Ramon, the park district, and in conjunction with the Sierra Club um, uh, for the Fria residential developers. Um, as part of that settlement agreement, not only are we getting the 141 acre open space, but the developers will be constructing for us um, a 25 car staging area located along the Chen property, <laughs> right along Bollinger Canyon Road. Now I'll go into detail on that in the following slides. Um, but as you can see here, um, together these five uh, parcels highlighted in green come together uh, to form the southern portion of Las Trompas. And because of the way they came to the park district as either conditions of approval, residential development, or settlement agreement, it it was a right. It became ripe for a land use plan amendment to be done to formally incorporate them into Las Trompas. Typically, we've done land use plans and land use plan land use plan amendments for the entire parkland. But because of the way they came, uh, this land use plan amendment focuses just on these five parcels. 
Um, in going over the land use plan amendment recommendations, we will be planning to open the land bank properties highlighted in the bright green, Peter's Ranch, Chen property, and Padva property. Uh, we include the, the recommendations include 4.2 miles of recreation trails to be open for public access. Uh, three new park access points uh, shown here in the purple stars. So that includes the one new staging area. It's a 25 car staging area along Bull Bollinger Canyon Road in the Chen property. One walk-in entrance with on-street parking coming from the Padva property and one walk-in entrance from the Furia Preserve residential development. The project also proposes to designate 201 acres as special resource protection area, uh, seen here highlighted in the kind of orange yellow. And the 201 acres includes conservation easements uh, that covers the Furia property uh, the, and within the uh, Padva property, as well as a 35 acre wetland complex within the existing open parkland. And it will designate, uh, the project will designate 99% of the project area as a natural unit. And this goes in line with um, Los Trampas being a wilderness regional preserve. This means uh, just 1% or even less than 1% of the project um, will have any recreational development. And the recreational development includes the trails and the staging area. And so the rest of the project is preserved um, as natural habitat uh, to enhance the biodiversity. Uh, some of the project benefits, it does achieve the park district's dual mission to both preserve open space and natural resources, uh, while also providing recreational opportunities. The project does close a gap along the Calaveras Ridge Trail highlighted in yellow. And it does connect uh, residents in the town of Danville and San Ramon uh, closer to Las Trampas. Currently, um, in order to get to Las Trampas, either there's a staging area along the north, the Ringtail Cat staging area, uh, or going all the way to the end of Bollinger Canyon Road to the main staging area. Uh, and going into details of each parcel for the Peters Ranch, again, there's the Calaveras Ridge Trail extension. Uh, this is about a 0.9 mile natural surface trail. Um, there will be a public access onto that trail from the Freer Preserve residential development. That uh, public access is proposed to be a walk-in entrance. Uh, and the proposed name is to be Saudade walk-in entrance. Saudade is a term, a Portuguese term um, to mean uh, nostalgia or deep longing. Um, in coming up with a name, it, we came across the term from Director Lane's uh, book, The San Ramon Chronicles, Stories of Bygone Days. Um, Rose Peters, who's the wife of Joe Peters of Joe, uh, Peters Ranch property, um, used that term to describe her childhood and growing up in the San Ramon Valley um, and the cattle ranching history. So we thought it'd be apt and a good name to, to acknowledge the Peters Ranch property. And um, I would like to provide kind of a drone footage of the, the conceptual alignment of the Calaveras Ridge Trail extension to kind of show a preview of the area uh, that the trail will be going through. So starting out, uh, Calaveras Ridge Trail extension will be 0.9 miles. It will extend from the existing ridge going through uh, the native grass. Uh, areas. Um, our trails team work very closely with our botanists and wildlife biologists to largely not only avoid drainages, but also important resources. Um, our trails team also work to come up with an alignment that provides trail users with a varied trail experience, um, providing some shade, shade relief, um, sun relief by going through some wooded areas, but also giving views of Mount Diablo and San Ramon Valley, and also on the other side of Rocky Ridge. Our trail team does provide a concept that, um, again, largely avoids uh, the drainages and going uh, away from the ravine. Um, as you can see here, we work with the existing steep, steep topo topography. Um, and the actual trail, this is just the concept, but the actual trail will largely depend on uh, what's on site. And as you can see here, because it's a natural surface trail, um, there will be sufficient room for multiple users to kind of pass through 
uh, each other. And then the trail does end at that walk-in entrance to the Faria Preserve residential development. Over on the Chen property, this photo you see here is the existing cattle corral that our grazer uses. Um, so the, at that staging, at that cattle corral is proposed to be the 25 car staging area that the Freer Preserve developers will be developing. Um, the existing cattle corral will be shifted a bit to the north, uh, right along Bollinger Canyon Road. Um, also proposed is public access from that staging area up to Los Trumpas Ridge, about 1.1 miles. This one will be a fire road um, that will provide emergency vehicles and maintenance access uh, right up to Los Trumpas Ridge. And there will also be a um, 0.8 mile natural surface trail, uh, a loop trail on this property proposed um, to be named the Warbler Loop Trail. The uh, EVMA trail that goes up to Los Trumpas, Los Trumpas Ridge is proposed to be named the Sabertooth Trail. Uh, going over to the Elworthy property, as I previously mentioned, it's already open to the public. There's a 12-car staging area, and the trail is uh, the Fiddle Neck Trail that goes right up to the Los Trumpas Ridge. And it does go through the private property. This is the private Elworthy property. That uh, private property does have a scenic easement over it, so it kind of restricts uh, the development of that area. Uh, here's a view of the driveway leading up to the staging area. Over on the Padre property, this is the 96 acre property where 30 acres of it will be protected by a conservation easement. This is to provide long-term management and monitoring uh, for that specific 30 acres uh, for the protection of important special status species. Uh, the property will have a walk-in entrance with on-street parking right along Wingfield Court. Uh, and from there, a trail will go through the Padva property and connect to the existing trail network within Las Trampas. Um, the, the trail name for that, um, for that existing trail is proposed to be named the Heritage Pear Trail in acknowledgement of the orchards of the San Ramon Valley, um, but also because there is currently an existing trail, uh, pear tree that we've seen. And this photo you see here was taken by staff just a few weeks ago, I believe, or at least a few months, but very recently. In this photo, the, or in this map, the yellow hashed area is where the conservation easement is located. And then the trail coming from the walk-in entrance goes along and then towards the end follows the conservation easement. And because it is close to the conservation easement, it does restrict, restrict uh, dogs to be on leash. And in the background of the slide are, uh, is a field of poppies that our park supervisor took a couple of years ago of uh, just the field of poppies in the property. Here's a view of the uh, entrance to the walk-in, uh, the walk-in entrance from Wingfield Court. Again, this was all developed in 2018 uh, prior to the acceptance by the park district. In the Faria property, which is anticipated to be dedicated to the park district next year, um, 136 acres of the property will be protected by a conservation easement, again, for the protection of special status species. The 25 car staging area that's proposed to be along Bollinger Canyon Road will be constructed by these developers um, as a condition, as, as a stipulation of the settlement agreement, again, by the city of San Ramon, the Park District, and the Sierra Club. Here are some photos we've taken from within the property. And finally, um, the about 201 acres is proposed to be designated as special resource protection area within the, the project area. This includes the 136 acres of conservation easement in the Faria property, 30 in the Padva property, and the 35 acre uh, mosaic wetland complex. And this is for the protection of the California red legged frog, as well as the California tiger salamander. Uh, one of the fascinating aspects of this project that I got to uh, experience and go through was that uh, right as we were about to release the notice of preparation for CEQA, um, we were uh, 
A one pregnant California tiger salamander was discovered in our project area, um, just one back in 2018, 2019. And since then, our park staff have gone back and monitored. And just last year, there were 28 CTS spotted. Ooh. And so they're doing well. <laughs> 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 and just to recap the Lupa recommendations, again, to open land bank properties, Peters Ranch, Chen, and Padva land bank properties, provide 4.2 miles of recreation trails, the three new park access points, the designation of the special resource protection area, and over 99% of the project area as a natural unit. What is a natural unit? A, a natural unit is just preser to preserve the natural environment and habitat and to protect the biodiversity of the, the park. Um, versus the recreation unit, which is the development for trails for staging areas. So the natural unit will not have any trails, will not have the staging area. Uh, those aspects of the, those components of the project are considered the recreation unit. So that would be part of the 1% of the project area. Okay. Uh, I would like to break down the trail recommendations. So the total trails for public access, again, is 4.2 miles. Of those 4.2 miles, uh, highlighted in blue on the map is the existing trail, 1.4 miles. That's the Heritage Pear Trail that will uh, just be recommended to be open for public access. That's already gone through CEQA, uh, already constructed by the developers. In terms of new construction, uh, that's the one highlighted in pink on the map. That's 2.8 miles, and that includes the Saber Tooth Trail, Warbler Loop Trail, and the Calaveras Ridge Trail extension. Uh, and breaking further down, 1.1 uh, mile of that new construction will be multi-use road for EVMA access. And then uh, the new natural surface trail, multi-use, new natural surface multi-use trail will be 1.7 miles. So that will be the Calaver Calaveras Ridge Trail extension and the Warbler Loop Trail. Uh, just, to uh, just to go over the, the CEQA process of this project, um, we first had a scoping meeting. That's when we went to the public and we had a community meeting. We held it as a scoping meeting, about 60 uh, people attended. Uh, and we received public input at that point. Uh, then the next step was to determine the CEQA level of environmental review. Uh, in preparing an initial study with our consultants, it was determined to be an environmental impact report. Uh, then we released the uh, notice of preparation of an EIR and the initial study to the public over a 30-day review period. At that time, we received 21 public comments using the public comments and uh, we worked with our consultants. We did the envir environmental analysis to draft, to prepare the draft EIR. Um, so in the EIR, it analyzes potential environmental impacts of the proposed project on the environmental resources, uh, such as air quality, uh, noise, um, wildfire. And the EIR determined that the proposed project would not result in any significant impacts all potential impacts would be produced to less than significant with mitigation measures. And the EIR, the draft EIR and draft land use plan amendment are currently available for review as hard copy at uh, Barlt to Oaks office, the Danville Library, San Ramon Library, and it's also available on our website. So right now we are uh, in the middle of the 45 day uh, public review process, a uh, review period. Following that, there will be the final EIR, which includes the response to comments document and the, the EIR itself. And that will go to the board, the full board of directors for certification. Um, I listed the public engagement efforts included as a part of this project. The ones in the red box pertain to CEQA. Again, the first one was the public scoping meeting in 2017. Um, we've uh, had some public engagement throughout. Then the 30-day review period for the NOP where we received the 21 comments. Um, in 2020 and 20, 2021, last year, we worked to incorporate these public comments into the project design. Uh, for example, some of the comments we received through that NOP were some concerns with uh, noise or smells coming from vault toilets at the staging area. So we worked with the Faria Preserves residential, uh, 
developers engineers to make sure we have the vault toilet as far back as possible away from the road while also allowing our maintenance staff to be able to access it. We've also worked with them to kind of adjust the, the egress and ingress into the staging area so that um, it addresses the concerns of the, the neighbors. Um, a dirt berm was also added to ensure that any potential headlights won't affect uh, the neighbors. So after the 30 day, sorry, after the 45 day public review period for the draft EIR, um, fo and following this board executive committee meeting, um, so there will also be a public hearing as part of that 45 day review period uh, during the PAC meeting, the Park Advisory Committee meeting. Um, and then we will actually also be going to the San Ramon Open Space Advisory Committee um, as part of public engagement. So the staff recommendation today is that the board executive committee forward a recommendation to the full board of directors to certify the draft environmental impact report and adopt the land use plan amendment for the Southern Las Trampas Wilderness Regional Preserve. Thank you. Thank you, I enjoyed the graphics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very well done, seeing exactly how a trail will be contoured to the topography there, that was excellent. Thank so, you. So thank you, Kim. I'll bring the topic to the committee and ask if there are any questions or comments from Director Rosario or Director Waspy. Director Rosario? Thank you. A very nice presentation, ma'am. This is very exciting. Uh, I'm not sure for you and your staff as well as the, the park district and, and our constituents, but um, in the um, in the 4.2 miles, uh, uh, well, let's, let's go back to uh, uh, the public comment or public input. Was there any dis any concern over trail width for the um, uh, the the new trails, like the Caliver that the connection to the Caliver Calaveras Ridge Trail, or the um, yeah, there was 1.7 miles there. Specifically about the width, yeah. Um, not during this 45-day comment period yet, and I, I'd have to get back to you about the 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 30-day NOP that was previously um, conducted. Um, I don't believe so, but I'll get back to yeah. you about that. So, uh, so the trails were uh, presented as multi-use. So, with was there a, a trail width associated with that? Yep. Uh, Brian will answer this question. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Brian Holt, Chief of Planning, Trails, and GIS. Um, I feel like I might be coming a little bit of a broken record on this conversation, uh, but it is um, it is kind of, um, again, our Ordinance 38 lines out uh, what, what uses can be allowed on which trails a different width. Um, so currently, uh, all uses equestrian hikers and bikers would be allowed um, within the uh, EVMA access, the, the fire roads that are throughout the property. Um, we did identify one, the uh, Peter's Ranch, the Calaveras Ridge connector trail. That was a necessary trail to build to basically connect what are two existing roads on either side of that property um, and to provide access from the free of preserve development up to that road. Um, part of the intent of doing the, the drone footage is to show the, the topography of that land is it's not practical for us to build that at a road width um, just because of the just because of the topography of that site. It would be, it would be extremely impactful to do so. Um, so that is proposed as a, as a narrow width trail, narrow width being less than eight feet. So uh, our equipment generally um, goes out, um, I think it's a, a six foot wide uh, sort of Swaco width that um, that uh, is the width of the trail. And that's how it would be, that's how it would be constructed through there. Um, the intent is to design it in a way that we as staff feel um, that it could be available uh, for multi-use. But again, um, that's an ongoing policy discussion um, here at the board. So when we say it's recommended for multi-use, that could be hiker and equestrian, that could be hiker, equestrian, and bikes. 
um, you know, that's that's sort of an ongoing discussion. So um, I don't necessarily want to uh, blow up this project with the with the questions of mountain bike access per se. Um, but what we did try to do is, um, and this is also evident in the the Warbler Loop Trail, is there's options there, and um, there is an EVMA fire road width access that goes up to the top. So those folks who are more comfortable with a wider trail have that opportunity. Um, and then we often hear, and we've heard through this project, um, an interest in more narrow gauge, more of a natural experience, trail experience. Uh, so that was the intent of also providing the, the Warbler, um, Warbler Loop Trail. But again, the, the question about bike access is an ongoing conversation that we continue to have, and I'm sure that we'll receive comments on that. Um, this is very much a CEQA environmental analysis process, analyzing you know what we can build on the ground, um, and that's an environmental issue. Um, the the question around trail conflict is really a social issue, so I so I'd rather um, sort of have that conversation as part of a separate sort of policy that we could do there um, as we move forward and actually building the recreation facilities here. Great, appreciate but, the clarification. So you're saying that if if staff ultimately ends up with a six foot wide trail that you think is viable for bicycles, you would come to us with an ordinance 38 amendment. That that would be that under our current system, yeah. that that's what would be required. Right. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. D. And then uh other than that, it's um uh, um it looks great. I I just wish there was a little bit more access, but I can see we're constrained by um access points. So um, thank you very much. That's all I have. Director Waspy. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this great presentation and the great uh, EIR and, and all the documentation. Uh, I'm, first off, I'm very happy that we're going to open up 756 acres of land bank area uh, to the public. I'm really happy about that. Really happy we're going to uh, work on connecting the Calaveras Ridge Trail. Um, I guess the only really real question I would have is when you refer to the um, parking that's going to occur at, say, the Chin property, uh, that's that's the one right on uh, Bollinger Canyon, which we all know about the corral right there. When you refer to free is going to build the lot for us, is that going to be, and I think you refer to it as an all-weather parking lot, does that mean it's going to be asphalt or is it going to be uh, dirt and gravel, uh, sort of a natural type parking lot? Uh, it will be a gravel lot. Um, the only concrete paved part will be the uh, ADA um, uh, spaces, but for the most part, the staging area will be uh, gravel and dirt. Uh, okay, so so of twenty five parking spaces, I would, is, I'm assuming three of them have to be ADA accessible. That, uh, it'll be a twenty five car staging area with, uh, I believe, two ADA accessible spots. Okay, so does that does that um, there's two paved spots, I don't know, the area that would be covered with asphalt. Does that um, make the, the process of, of pre-treatment of, of rainwater, uh, stormwater, uh, is that included? I mean, does that trigger that whole process and expense to do that? We've, uh, thank you for the question. We've looked into that with our stewardship staff and um, the the free preserves engineers um so i think once we following the the approval process that's when we work on the permits and then we'll be working with the uh, contra costa county uh to secure additional permits or to secure the permits and so at that point um uh, we'll know for sure if it does uh need any of the particular um uh, stormwater permits um yep and and either way um uh the FURIA folks are responsible for the cost of that right uh do you mean the cost of so the part of the, the settlement agreement um the FURIA developers will be uh taking on the cost of the construction of the the staging area and then the park district will be um working to acquire the permits uh, including the regulatory permits for the staging area okay um, thank you. And then on the um, um, Ellsworthy uh, staging area, that's 12 parking spots. Is that's going to be uh, gravel too, I, I suspect? Oh, the 12 car staging area on the Ellsworthy property that has already been open to the public that was constructed back in 2015. Oh, um, I okay. believe that is also a dirt 
Yes, that's also a dirt. Uh, I've been there. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's unfortunate that uh, Director Lane is traveling because I believe she would be uh, very supportive and uh, excited by uh, bringing this along and heading it toward completion with the with the board. I don't have any uh, questions or comments other than thank you for the presentation. Uh, would one of you gentlemen like to make a motion to accept the staff recommendation? I will channel uh, Director Lane. And, uh, and then I'll take public comment. Yeah, and then I'll move. I move, uh, I make the motion to, to approve. Second. All right, we have, I know of one request for public comment. If there are folks on Zoom that wanna raise their hands. Otherwise, I know that Jim Hansen has uh, requested public comment opportunity. Uh, correct, we actually do have somebody from the public that would like to speak on this agenda item. Present. Um, Okay, so yeah, so she will actually be joining us um, towards the end of the meeting for the public comment time. Um, so she'll re she'll be returning. So this will be public comment, not on this agenda. Item. Yeah. Okay. And then Got it. Um, I do have Jim Hansen who wanted to speak. Okay. On this item. Go ahead and call on Jim. And he, go ahead, Jim Hansen. Thank you. You're on mute, Jim. Glad I get that by about now. Uh, Jim Hansen, Conservation Chair, California Plant Society. Uh, thank you for the presentation and um, it's great to see the work on this park. Just wanted to, to say that we're really not prepared to make comment at this time. We would like to, but our, our information from the staff announcement was that this was a presentation only. So unfortunately, we will not be able to inform your decision in any way uh, regarding uh, adopting this plan as is. We will be prepared as the staff uh, announcement made to comment uh, at the board level, which I will say was a little confusing. It says the only public hearing would be at the PAC. So we're trying to sort through all this. All I can say is Based on what we were told, this is a presentation. So we we unfortunately can't make any comments to you on this. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. When is it, I, I say again, when is it anticipated that this will go to the full board? It's not on your chart. Uh, so far, we only have the public hearing at the PAC on the 28th of this month, uh, but the, the date to go to the board is uh, to be determined at this point. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. why it's not on the chart. And if I can just add, we're a little confused if the board not, we'll, we'll try to find out if the board is taking comments at their meeting from the public on the plan, uh, because it only says there's one public hearing at your advisory committee, uh, which is a process I'm not familiar with. Thanks. Brian? If, if I could, just real quick, Brian Holt, Chief of Planning, Trails, and GIS. I appreciate appreciate the comments from, uh, from Mr. Hansen and CMPS. Uh, the public comment period is open now. It'll continue to run through December 14th. December 14th. So we'll be accepting comments throughout that period, um, and uh, and we'll be accepting comments at the PAC meeting. Um, so uh, so plenty of opportunities to provide comments, uh, and all a summary of those comments and responses will be provided to the full board. And ultimately, we will have public comment on the full board meeting to approve. Absolutely, this. there's a, a, always uh, always an opportunity for the public to comment as it goes to the board. So it sounds like there's several vehicles, Jim. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for the input. How can you provide uh, And I would like to uh, let you know that you can provide public comments um, by email uh, in writing to um, my email at ktai at ebparks.org. Uh, you can also mail them to the park district's headquarters in Peralta Oaks. Um, and the information is available on our park district website um, with additional information on the addresses. Thank you. That's helpful. Monica? Thank you. And we also have Scott uh, Bartleball who would like to speak.
Hello, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, comment and um, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was very informative and the materials that were provided in the packet and uh, on the planning website. Um, looks like a, a very good plan to provide access uh, to, to this parcel while also maintaining a very high degree of, of conservation um, in, in the area with recreation limited to, to 1% of uh, the, the total acreage. Um, we're glad to see, uh, well, I, I'm advocacy director for Bicycle Trails Council of the East Bay, sorry. Um, so speaking on behalf of our membership and um, trail users uh, across the East Bay. Um, we're glad to see that the trails are designated for multi-use at this point. So designed with that in mind, realizing that those decisions will happen down the road. Um, with this being new trail construction um, or existing roadways or roadway with new construction um, where possible, um, it seems that bicycle access should be very feasible um, and, and minimize conflict. Um, I think the animated view of the um, Calaveras Ridge Trail extension shows that the bulk of that is in open grassland and the, the sections that are envisioned to go in the tree line uh, appear that it would be very easy to have um, good sight lines in those areas. Um, the six foot wide Swaco width um, provides a lot of space when combined with um, new design with multi-use intent. Um, the, the other areas, uh, we didn't see an animation in the warbler loop, but the saber tooth is, is planned to be road width. Um, so from that point of view, it, it doesn't look like a high conflict area. Um, this does provide some good connectivity um, for the, the local residents uh, to get into this area and a variety of trails um, with access there. So we, we urge the board to, to support this and, and move this forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. So I kind of jumped the gun and have a motion and second already. <laughs> so uh, if there's no further public comment. Oh, so we do have Jody Cover who would like to speak on the item. Oh, and she's here in the public. We have someone present here. Yes. Nice That's change. Delightful, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, uh, my name is Jody Culver. And I'm a resident of Crow Canyon Road. So the the entire free project has been um, so impactful because of the, of the devastation to that whole hillside. So I'm I um, I'm happy to see that the uh, oh uh, the free pr preserve project they are now growing, uh, planting out valley oaks as well as uh, coast live oaks. Okay, so what I'm I'm, I'm hoping to address is um, the interface with the uh, park district and the FRIA project preserve. I'm hoping that they actually do, the park district uh, um, actually does a restoration where they plant native trees that uh, would be represented in that area, like uh, not just coast live oaks, which I see, mostly coast live oaks, like valley oaks, and perhaps even bays and madrones, buckeyes, and even uh, native grasses, uh, so that we um, really restore that hillside as much as possible. So I think those native plantings could potentially make a huge difference because there, there presently there's a lack of biodiversity with that major, um, I would say devastation of that hillside. So that is it, mostly. <laughs> so anyway, that's it. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for coming in today. Yeah, sure. Very much appreciated. Thank you for the input. Any further comment? Kim, did you want to say something? No? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, Monica? Hmm? Oh. Uh, sure, I'll ask if uh, there's any uh, response to the planting of uh, native trees and shrubs and such. Uh, so that was in reference to the Faria Preserves uh, 
residential development, um, which is separate from the, the property that will be coming to the park district. It, it's adjacent, but that is their own project. project. Um, Jody was referring to the some of the plantings that they're doing as part of their mitigation for, for their residential development uh, on their property. Okay. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Kim. So, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll of the committee? Yes. President the motion Coffey. was made and seconded, so we're to oh, the perfect. motion. So, President Coffey? Aye. Oh, Director Rosario? Aye. And Director Waspy? Aye. So, we have approved the staff recommendation on the Thank MTP. You. Thank you. So this brings us to item number three, electric bicycle policy update with Deputy General Manager, uh, Jim O'Connor. I wanted to um, mention uh, up front that this was placed on the executive committee uh, agenda at my request. Uh, and I confirmed with uh, Jim and legal counsel before the meeting that this is intended as an information only item that despite our little R next to the stat under the status, uh, the uh, report uh, was designed as information only at this point. And I asked that the item be taken up by the exec committee because I thought that the issue was important enough to get the process of considering e-bike policy uh, before the board of directors, before directors Wieskamp and Lane left the board. Now, this thought came about when Director Lane and I read the MidPen report that's extensively referenced in our staff report and thought that, you know, this would be a good basis. Uh, they, they did very detailed studies and surveys uh, to start our own process. And I thought it was important to start this process because from my own observations as someone who frequently uh, hikes on the Bay Trail near my home, and uh, once or twice a month in Brioni's, that uh, the, uh, you know, what metaphor do you want to use? The, <laughs> the, the, the cows out of the barn, the trains out of the station, <laughs> that uh, there are e-bat bikes everywhere. And it's clear to me that e-bikes are gradually replacing ordinary bikes. We probably should have started a process of developing e-bike policy several years ago when this started happening. But it's really come forward and with, with a very um, major uh, need uh, after COVID and so many people went out and bought e-bikes and people my age in particular are taking up biking again. I am because I've now rented it uh, an e-bike on, on, on occasion mm -hmm. uh, when traveling and I can bike effectively once again, despite my sciatica and, <laughs> and, and age. Um, so the reality out there is that e-bikes are here, e-bikes are replacing ordinary bikes, and we need to catch up with this. So I wanted to get it on the agenda so we could start the process while Bev Lane and uh, Ann Wieskamp were still on the board. Uh, and then again, uh, Bev is traveling, so she's not here. I sort of had in the back of my mind that Bev would be at this meeting. Um, so we have to figure out how to get this uh, an opportunity for those two uh, board members to have their important input on the issue before they uh, depart. So that means one of the two meetings perhaps in December from the board. The other question I have in terms of process, Jim, is has the PAC uh, discussed e-bikes at all or have they been focused on just the Brioni's policy? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, President Coffey and members of the committee, Jim O'Connor, Deputy General Manager. Um, the item of e-bikes was on the uh, Park Advisory Committee uh, work plan for the year, but it has not been discussed to date as far as I know. All right. Well, that's my final point then is we need to put this this report before the PAC as well. Okay. Um, before acting on it. So that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate uh, our, our conversation before the meeting to clarify some of that. Okay. Yeah. And so we, we're we really here to get some input from uh, the committee in terms of direction. And I think that um, you're absolutely right. Uh, President Coffey, uh, the word I use is that e-bikes have become ubiquitous. 
Uh, I hike quite a bit in the park district parks and I um, on the Iron Horse Trail almost every day. And they are there and I think they're in a high percentage uh, these days. So um, I think the time to have the discussion, uh, you might have been right maybe a couple of years ago, but uh, they are here and we need to uh, address the issue. So uh, with that, I'm going to start my uh, PowerPoint here and go through some some comments and some topics. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Let's see. There we are. Oops. Okay. So let's start out with, um, uh, I'll start out with uh, just a review of park district policy and some of the state laws uh, related to e-bike use. Uh, things have changed in the last few years, I think, as most of you know. Our 2013 master plan update included uh, language regarding public access, specifically the topic of green transportation. Uh, the public access goal five, I'll, I'll just read it really quickly here. The district will cooperate with local and regional planning efforts to create more walkable and bikeable, bikeable communities and coordinate park access opportunities with local trails and bike paths developed by other agencies to promote green transportation access to regional parks and trails. Um, this emphasis on alternate transportation, green transportation has been a, a big emphasis and our legislative efforts. And those efforts to date since 2000 have resulted in $48 million uh, being uh, coming from federal and state grant uh, funds to the district for park development, especially along our regional trails. That's, that's quite a bit of effort there. So um, we've been big in the green transportation business and e-bikes are a part of that as we'll talk about some more. Um, in 2015, Governor Brown signed AB 1096, uh, which was all about electric bikes and some other uh, uh, California vehicle code related sections. But what it essentially did is it reclassified electric bikes. Um, they were formally classified under the California vehicle code as motor vehicles. And what it did is it created three classes of electric bicycles. Uh, and all of those classes uh, are limited in power to 750 watts, which is roughly about one horsepower. And that also 1096 allowed for e-bike use, which was formerly illegal on bike paths, bikeways, and bicycle lanes, allowed those to be used there. Class one and two allowed unless restricted by local registry um, jurisdictions. And it prohibited class three bikes unless allowed by the local jurisdiction. So uh, with that, we'll move forward here in time. So just a quick review. Um, AB 1096 then uh, resulted in some changes to the California Vehicle Code, specifically here, uh, Section 312.5, which uh, lays out the three classes of electric bicycles. So Class 1 are um, electric-powered bicycles that are pedal assist. They do not have a throttle. They're, uh, the motor assists the rider by assisting the pedal action up to 20 miles an hour. After 20 miles an hour, the motor cuts out. Class two e-bikes have a throttle, a hand-operated throttle uh, that assists the, uh, activates the motor. And that again is up to 20 miles an hour. At that point, the motor cuts off once the bicycle reaches 20 miles an hour. Class three e-bikes are pedal assist bikes again, uh, but the motor can assist the rider up to 28 miles an hour. And at that point, the motor cuts out. So those are the three classes of electric bicycles that are defined by the California Vehicle Code. Um, in response to this change in the law and also uh, public requests for the use of electric bicycles, uh, specifically on uh, our paved regional trails, uh, we conducted an e-bike pilot project uh, starting in 2017 on, our, on three of our paved regional trails, the Iron Horse, the um, uh, Contra Costa Canal Trail, and the Alameda Creek Trail. And we did some studies, we did uh, several surveys, uh, we did some counts, uh, and we brought back that information to the board, to the board operations committee, and then to the full board. And then in 2019, we updated Ordinance 38 to allow uh, Class 1 and Class 2 e-bikes on eight of our paved regional trails, specifically um, the Alameda Creek Trail, the Big Break Trail, Contra Costa Canal Trail, the Delta De Anza Trail, the George Miller Trail, the Iron Horse Trail, the Lafayette Moraga Trail and the Marsh Creek Trail. So that was in 2019. 
at that time, I just want to make a point that we had not, we still had a prohibition on e-bikes on all of our other trails, including on unpaved trails and that exist in uh, the majority of our parks. So let's just, just talk about what's happening with e-bikes. What does the e-bike world look like? Um, the market is strong. In 2021, 88,800, excuse me, 800,080 uh, bikes were purchased. That's almost double the 450,000 bikes sold in 2020 and almost three and a half times the 250,000 bikes that were sold in 2019. Uh, most of those are class one e-bikes. That's 45% of those. And that trend is expected to continue. Globally, the e-bike industry by the end of the decade will be $41 billion industry. Some European countries are expecting to sell more e-bikes than they are vehicles uh, in the near uh, future. E-bike cost, uh, which has been a big factor in um, limiting the number of bikes sold, is coming down quickly. Uh, you can get some bikes now under $1,000. I, I have a little picture there of a, a manufacturer called Electric. That bike that you see there is $899. So the cost of these bikes has been prohibited in terms of their um, uh, more diverse use through the community. Uh, that's coming down. So that factor that's restricting their use is coming down. So clearly, the information we're talking about is that this um, use of e-bikes is becoming more and more ubiquitous in the community for multiple reasons, transportation and recreation. Now, what's happening with our, our fellow agencies, our fellow uh, public agencies that operate recreational trail systems? We always like to see what's happening out there uh, with the other agencies and compare ourselves to them. So I did a little uh, survey here. Uh, we've done this and it's also some of this information also comes out of the mid peninsula Regional Open Space uh, Study. So Santa Clara County, what they've done down there, they've opened all of their trails where they allow, currently allow conventional bikes. They've opened all of those trails to class one and class two e-bikes. Mid Peninsula recently had a meeting which we'll discuss um, where they limited class one and two uh, bikes to Ravenswood, which is a fairly urban um, preserve on the bay, and then Rancho San Antonio, uh, which is uh, located near Los Altos, uh, and that's a more urban park also. Otherwise, the bikes are prohibited on the remainder of their trails. Marin County allows, um, excuse me, that should be class one and two on paved bicycle trails and roads uh, only unless they're signed for such use to allow it. Marin Municipal Water District has no e-bikes allowed except on public roads where vehicles are normally allowed. Uh, Walnut Creek Open Space has allowed Class 1 and 2 uh, anywhere conventional bikes are allowed. Sonoma County Regional Parks, Class 1 bikes, uh, anywhere conventional bikes are allowed. Solano County uh, allows Class 1 e-bikes anywhere conventional bikes are allowed. California State Parks is done on a park-by-park -park basis by superintendent order. Uh, mostly where they're allowed, it's Class 1 uh, bikes where conventional bikes are allowed except in the state vehicle recreation areas where they allow even the class three bikes to be used, which of course those are open to motorcycles and OHV travel. And at Golden Gate National Recreation Area, they allow class one and two bikes anywhere conventional bikes are allowed. Majority of that is paved trails uh, within uh, GGNRA. So that's what's happening with several of the agencies in the, in the Bay Area. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to focus down on uh, Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, as you know, as you've referenced, they did a, a very um, intense two-year study process to look at the issue of e-bikes. And before I get into the data, I want to talk a little bit about Mid-Peninsula. We, we often talk to them, uh, refer to them as kind of a sister agency in terms of regional parks. Um, they operate in two counties like we do, but they are an open space agency. Um, there, when we talk about passive recreational use in our, in our parks, uh, theirs is even less than that. They have one campground. It's a backcountry campground. They do not have developed picnic areas. Um, so they're very much trail focused. And that is where we have an alignment with them in terms of their trail system and our trail system, the issues we deal with, the types of uses that are allowed. Um, that's very close to our own trail system. So we think that the work that the, um, the incredible work that the staff did is very comparable um, in terms of our challenges that we face on our trails and it's very much a proxy for um, our own trail system. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what uh, they did. 
So they did uh, almost a two-year review process and included a one-year pilot project at Ravenswood and Rancho San Antonio where they allowed class one and two e-bikes. They also did an intercept survey of riders at uh, Santa Clara County Parks, uh, which interfaced with their preserves in many locations. So they went out to their unpaved trails and did intercept surveys with um, trail users. They did a specific study on e-bike noise and the potential impacts to wildlife. Um, they also have what's called their uh, science advisory panel. And that science advisory panel conducted a literature review of e-bike research related impacts and benefits, trying to look at if there was um, some scientific studies about the potential impacts of e-bikes. And then they also did a review of their enforcement citation and accident uh, report data. And I'm just gonna do a highlight of some of that. And I did provide a link in the staff report to that full study, if anybody have to see it. Um, there's also a, uh, a um, YouTube video of that entire meeting if somebody wants to look at that. So let's take a look at some of this data. So this is the pilot study at Ravenswood at Rancho San Antonio or RSA. So they divided up the questions into one first class one e-bike use, uh, 556 total um, users were, um, were surveyed. So 40% of those users supported the use on paved and unpaved uh, use, that's class one bikes. Um, they also looked at class two bikes and 21% supported the use on paved and unpaved, 21% supported use on paved only, uh, I think, uh, and then 39% opposed all class two e-bike use. So it's sort of like at different polls for the different types of classes here. So class one was well supported. Um, and then you have uh, class two was not supported by uh, this survey. Then they went out to Santa Clara County Parks and uh, did some trail work there. They, they interviewed um, 1,186 people and 56% of those supported the use of class one e-bikes and 16% uh, were opposed, 23% were neutral and 4% were unsure. But generally when you look at the report, they talk about that being the number of um, like 62%. I'm not sure where they came up with that, but anyway, generally in favor of class one uh, bike use. Um, they also, because they had very few um, interactions with equestrians while they were out in Santa Clara County Parks, they did a direct outreach to several uh, equestrian associations that typically use Santa Clara County Parks. And I think the, I think the results here are not surprising to any of us. 70% were opposed to the use of class one e-bikes on unpaved trails, 10% uh, were neutral, and I actually was surprised 6.7% were in support of it uh, on unpaved trails. And then they also did an accumulation of all of their general public comments, that's through email, letters, and public meetings, comments that were directly made at public meetings. And generally that was 69% uh, support of e-bikes on all trails. Um, they also specifically um, uh, hired H.T. Harvey and Associates to do a study related to noise. I think all of us can understand that the one true difference between uh, e-bikes and uh, regular conventional bikes is the motor and the potential noise that it makes. So um, they looked at that in terms of bats, uh, bat species and bird species. They determined that most of the impacts of backs are due to high frequency noise generated by the electric motor. And what they did is they, the way they set this up is they had people, um, they, I think they had six different e-bikes come by and conventional bike as a, as a, uh, as a um, uh, you know, test against that. And so they had them ride by and they had microphones set up at different distances from the trail. And what they were looking for was, um, uh, decibel was just power reading of noise at different frequencies and then how that attenuated over distance. So out of that study, what they determined is um, with distance, the noise would attenuate and the frequency most, it was around 20 kilohertz was mostly interfering with specific bat species, pallid bat species. And I think it was the uh, Thompson speaker bat species were specifically um, sensitive to that. Uh, that range of noise. And so what came out of that, they came up with some buffer 
uh, recommended buffers between recreational trails and potential roost sites for these species. Um, there were two known sites within the preserves that Mid Pen uh, operates, and neither one of those was near a recreational trail. The Science Advisory Panel did their literature review. There were too few studies on e-bike impacts to be statistically useful was one of their determinations or the studies themselves um, were not vigorous enough to come up with valid uh, data. Uh, out of their study, they, they did look talk about six potential impacts of e-bikes, wildlife disturbance, noise, uh, distance and duration, what that means is uh, somebody using an e-bike can go for a longer distance into a preserve or into a park uh, and can ride for a longer period of time, obviously because of the assistance provided by the motor. Uh, they looked at soils erosion, vegetation, and also talked about visitor experience. Um, visitor experience was also had a positive benefit in that uh, older bike riders uh, can continue their uh, their biking activity into a longer period of time, much like you discussed, Director Coffey, in terms of your own experience. Uh, also, those people with mobility challenges also could uh, be assisted by electric bicycle in terms of their access into parks uh, and trails. Um, and then they also had most of those, uh, one of the findings that most of those impacts were consistent with conventional bikes based on the data that they could find. Uh, they also had recommendations about how to deal with uh, e-bikes, but almost all of those were consistent with current practices at Mid-Peninsula in terms of managing bike use on trails. So what was the result? Uh, all of this data was presented at um, the Mid-Peninsula board meeting on June 29th. I've watched that meeting twice uh, myself. Um, they voted uh, four, uh, four yes, two no's, and, and excuse me, that should be one absence. And they affirmed the prohibition of e-bikes on district unpaved trails, except for the use of class one and class two e-bikes at both uh, Ravenswood Open Space Preserve and Rancho San Antonio Preserve. So basically the status quo maintained the status quo at Mid-Peninsula. Uh, a key decision point, for the board um, was looking at their policy statements and uh, specifically C2, preservation of the opportunity for tranquil nature study and observation was one of their key discussion points uh, in their um, deliberations on the matter. So what are the key takeaways um, based on the current information we have from a staff perspective? So many Bay Area public agencies that manage public recreational trail systems have adopted policies allowing class one e-bikes anywhere conventional bikes are allowed. Current scientific research does not show that the impacts of e-bikes differ substantially from conventional bikes, except for noise, potentially. Management of e-bikes is almost identical to conventional bikes, except for the potential impacts related to noise. Uh, and that was on the one study by H.T. Harvey. E-bike usage has become common in district parks to the point that enforcement of restrictions would be time-consuming and non-productive compared to a focus on rider behavior. And this is what the chief often refers to as behavior over batteries. How people are riding uh, is the consistent uh, thing we want to focus on. E-bikes can facilitate trail access for older people and others with mobility challenges and are playing an increasingly vital role in promoting green transportation options. So where does the staff stand on this in terms of what where we want to go in the future? Um, we would like to take this to the board for an ordinance 38 change to allow class one e-bikes on all district trails that currently allow conventional bike use. Um, and we want to continue the use of class two e-bikes on the eight regional trails that currently allow e-bike usage. So uh, with that, I will uh, take any questions. I also have Chief Chiribiro here as any questions related to enforcement. Thank you, Jim. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, <laughs> it is the big issue. So back to the committee, director comments and questions. Director Rosario. 
Yeah, um, I'm very happy that we're here. This is not a uh, uh, recommended, I mean, um, a recommendation to the board that it is in fact informational, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you for making that clarification early. Uh, so, because I think it's really important. This is a this is a huge um, uh, change, and I think it, it's it's really important that we have uh, as much public input as possible. Um, and um, and the PAC definitely needs to uh, uh, take a, a bite of, of this as well. And um, uh, um, and I think this is a great opportunity, especially now that we have some agencies that are um, already adopted uh, policies allowing uh, e-bikes to some extent. Uh, it would be great to follow them and uh, see what their uh, what their experiences is, and uh, include that in in our uh, in our in public input. And um, yeah, it's 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 a huge deal and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to make I don't want to make uh, I don't want to make a misstep whether whether we go one way or the other, but I, I want to make sure that we get as as much input as as possible. So uh, I guess I'm advocating for a public a public process, uh, and that you know there really is no. We've been sitting on this for a while, a couple more months, or 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 even half a year. Uh, just adds to the. Um, uh, uh, adds to the process, but also adds to the data that we need. So, uh, and then uh, class class two class two they have a they have a throttle, mm -hmm. but uh, do they have to be pedaling? There are both bikes that I've seen class two. There's some that are pure throttle, and then there are some that are both a throttle and pedal. So there's a mixture of those that I've seen. Okay. Yeah, the bikes. I mean, um, some of the bikes that I've seen, e-bikes I've seen on the trail, they're obviously not pedaling. Yeah. So I I have issues with those, and uh, I really would like to ha hear a discussion uh, in those in this process of how how we're going to um, um, manage some some of these. Uh, these critical things, I, I think that are critical. Number one is determining uh, uh, how we're going to how we're, how we're, how is the public going to be able. I mean, we have a we have a red card system. Uh, how are we going to track all this, and um, and how we're going to enforce the? Uh, yes, we're going to enforce bad behavior, but not. Uh, Some of these things are when they're using when they're on full throttle. Very hard to get a description of some of these folks that are that are on there. Um, so it, it, I would hear like to hear a discussion how that our best practices on uh, enforcing some of uh, the issues that we're going to face with with uh, e bikes, speed especially. Yeah, I mean, we have common methods for, you know, radar use, et cetera, to uh, manage speed. And I know the officers do go out and do some targeted enforcement on occasion regarding speed. So we do have common practice around the issue of speed, which is yeah. what you're discussing in terms of throttle bikes. Yeah. Well, I, I think there needs to be a discussion as well as to, um, and we have an SEU unit. Uh, I mean, with the, with the uh, addition of a lot of new trails, in, in just this year alone, uh, we should we should talk about uh, increasing that 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 uh, SEU um, capability as far as um, more officers in that unit. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm as long as we're having a public process and uh, being inclusive, because I think it's um, this is a big deal. So, thank you. I think what he's emphasizing, Jim, is that the management of these issues are pretty much the same with conventional bikes. In other words, we have conventional bikes that speed, especially on the regional trails, unfortunately. Uh, and you will have e-bike people who uh, speed. And so the, the enforcement is the same. Um, although I have my own observations about 
e-bike behavior, um, which is more positive than negative in, in terms of what I, I've observed. Uh, but I'll bring it back to, were you, were you uh, yeah. concluded? Okay, Director Waspy. Uh, yeah, thank you. I agree. This is going to be, uh, I think this is overwhelming. I think it's happening uh, around us. So we have to be prepared with, with some answers and, and, and figure out some things to do. I, I, um, I'll never get away from the fact that I think we're, have, we have a whole new group of people coming to the park district that wouldn't be there before that have access that they wouldn't have. I think that's a good thing. I also, I don't think there's any doubt that a bicycle may, does more damage than a hiker and then the, who, who knows where a horse comes in there or anything, but impact of the district, you're just giving, by putting an electric motor on a bike, you, you're extending someone's reach into quote wilderness or whatever word calling wilderness. Um, it's going to it's going to be a big impact and i think the the more data i see the better i will feel and so some of the the um the related citations i understand um there were 58 bicycle related citations and, and many reasons for them in 2021 i think that's a function of uh, just being out there. I, you could probably find all the citations you wanted to. Um, I'm not interested in giving citations for citations sake, but uh, I, I think we need to protect the public. And, and I think some of the things I hear, I don't know how we deal with the issues of, of uh, uh, degradation of our, our, our protected areas, but I, I, I'm very interested in some things um, like they were reporting bicycle accidents and, I, and there seems to have been an increase that you're stating that in 2019 there were 52 reported bicycle accidents uh, and in 2020 it went up to 102. I'm more interested and I know we can break this down because we do this kind of data stuff all the time. I'm interested in how many bike versus pedestrian accidents there are in the district. I'm interested in how many bike versus bike accidents there are. And I'm interested in how many e-bike versus bike accidents there are. Um, and, uh, you know, they did another bullet point down there in this district related citations accidents, neither the citation database nor the accident database distinguishes between e-bikes and conventional bikes. I think we should. <laughs> I think it's important. I think it's, it's, it's another piece of data that we really, really need to, to provide if, if we're going to make decisions on this. Uh, and you know, I'd also uh, another thing that I'm very concerned with, and I, I, I hesitate tread lightly on this one, but I'm wondering if we add a lot of e-bikes, whether we are um, as a district are open to more lawsuits, uh, because I think there is a different skill level involved um, in the two. Um, groups of, of riders or two groups of people that ride a regular bike and an e-bike. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we have any, I mean, we obviously we have uh, that on record, but I'd like to know if we've been, uh, uh, if we've been sued over an e-bike accident on district parks. And other than that, uh, I'd say I look forward to the, the discussion, the debate, but um, I, I know it'll happen and I know we need to do it. Would either of you object to having this as an information item for the full board in December sometime? Yeah. Not at all. I think I think it would be a good idea. We would start this discussion, right. and then uh, without a doubt, and, then, and we'd have the input of our two yeah. members who will be leaving, and then ultimately the decision will be left to the future board mm -hmm. with two new board board members. Yeah, I think I think it's appropriate. Okay, I just wanted to get that process down with <laughs> the the committee. So, you know, I view this issue as I view how we are dealing at large with the new volumes. In other words, we have a lot more people using parks and we have a lot more bicyclists. You sh showed us uh, statistics at Brioni's. Um, and we're spending a lot of time and energy and resources in, in dealing with these new volumes. And so we're going to have more bikes. I, I realize and I agree there are a lot of issues to address, but the reality that we're, we have is that e-bikes will ultimately become probably fairly soon the majority of bicycle users in our parks and on our trails. Um, I was out at Brioni's the other evening and uh, at least, and a lot of mountain bikers were coming in. 
um, at least half were uh, e-bikes. And, you know, I understand that by providing motors, you are extending the ability of people to utilize the parks. Mm -hmm. um, I have trouble with the concept of that being a bad thing when we are continually trying to figure out how to provide access to the parks in a reasonable manner while protecting habitat, while protecting op open space. That is our fundamental tension in what we do. And this just presents that issue um, in yet another way. Um, I mean, I, I do see that this will allow additional users up on ridges, for instance, where people like myself don't go <laughs> if, if we're on a bike because it's too steep. Uh, so it could lead to increased volume in terms of depth and, and some of the scope of the use of our parks. But, you know, overall, I don't think we're adding significantly to, to volume by allowing the e-bikes because once again, they're replacing conventional bikes. So there will be some percentage of those users, mostly older folks like me, who will be there who weren't before. So, you know, that that's that's probably some statistic we could guess at. Um, but otherwise, we're just dealing with um, with with volume as we are and have to do uh, because of these volumes. I'm comfortable with saying something as you have to the effect that we can't enforce our rules. And we know that today because, again, half the, uh, the, the bikes I saw at Brioni's the other evening were e-bikes. E and I appreciate that Chief Chaburro doesn't want his people giving people like me a ticket because, uh, you We're know, I'm in my 60s and, <laughs> and, and I'm on an e-bike. Um, and I view this as I do a number of enforcement issues that we deal with as, you know, the, the enforcement issues, the equivalent of trying to succeed in preventing graffiti. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to have police everywhere all the time to, to, to enforce this. And not only is enforcement therefore impossible, I'll use the term, I mean, you could try, um, but it would, it's, it's gonna be unrealistic because it will effectively ban people who use bicycles once many of them are uh, now using e-bikes. I have a question and that is, why the dis distinction between class one and class two in these agencies that, and, and in your own recommendation that we limit access to just class one. Um, I questioned the distinction because you can't speed any faster in with a class two than a class one. Um, and then again, there's the enforcement issue. I guess our folks would be out there and maybe see the little throttle. There's a, as my recollection for my use of, uh, my use has been of class two. Um, there is a little box there that, that, uh, I guess is the throttle, mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of hard. That's a nuance to you know, watching someone go by in an e-bike. Basically, the only way you could enforce a uh, prohibition on class two is if you caught someone not pedaling. And, or with no pedals at all. Or with no pedals at all. <laughs> I've never seen that. I've never seen anybody on our trails not pedaling, even old people, you know, even uphill. Um, so I, you know, again, I have a, a, I see the majority of these agencies uh, don't distinguish between class one and class two. And uh, so may, maybe that that's the answer, but you, you could have your own um, thoughts on that, obviously. It's a, it's a really good, good question. I, um, I think that uh, one of the challenges that we have seen out in parks um, is that there, of course, we're here we are near Silicon Valley, right? And so of course people start to, mod these things a lot of the leading edge technology around this shows up around here because people have money to buy this uh, type of technology 
And so we have seen these really high-end bikes that are um, can go well over 28 miles an hour. Essentially, they're electric motorcycles that have showed mm-hmm. up. We've we've actually and scooters. Uh, you know, we actually cited somebody in Pleasanton Ridge, I believe it was, um, several months ago. I think the idea here is that clearly uh, a pedal bike is a pedal bike, and uh, we thought that that would be probably a better place to start. Um, and and actually, there's a practical reality around that from the information that I've read is that most of the mountain bike manufacturers that are manufacturing uh, e-mountain bikes, most all of them are looking at class one because that is uh, is what the market is. That's what people want. They just want that assistance going uphill. And remember, and, and this goes to one of the questions that director or comments that director uh, Waspy made is that um Going uphill, there's a very little difference. Uh, the one study that they did uh, measuring speed uphill between uh, e-bikes and regular bikes was only about a difference of 1.2 miles an hour. Um, downhill, that's gravity. And if you're an out-of-control rider, you're an out-of-control rider. One of the other statistics that I saw was interesting is that the average age of an e-bike rider was 52 and the average age, and this is mountain bikes, and the average age of a non a conventional e a mountain bike was 34. <laughs> so uh, some of that's an economic reason, and some of it goes to the uh, question or comment that you made about older riders extending their riding careers um, through the use of uh, e-bike technology. So that was the reasoning why we thought um, class one might be a, a better way to start. It's a really easy distinction between somebody who's throttling and who's not. Uh, it's easier for enforcement purposes, uh, and it's probably and it matches what the uh, the market is in terms of what's out there and what people are using. Okay, but I, I'm just saying there is a reality. If I have a class two, and I'm in one of our parks, I should just keep pedaling. So yeah, <laughs> and so I don't get a ticket. Yeah, and um, just behaving generally that would be helpful. Huh? Yes, unless I'm going downhill. And fr- my observation on the Bay Trail is conventional bikes speed downhill because they want to build momentum as the trail flattens out or goes uphill, e-bikes don't have that motive. They just... This just gravity. Also, e-bikes are, are very heavy. And uh, sometimes that slows people down because the you know they don't have the mobility uh, when they're riding downhill. So that also can be a factor. And so, you know, the access issue is one, you know, I, I view a little like the solar issue that we want to be a green agency, right? We want to promote uh, uh, green values. And... That holds with solar until it's going to disrupt habitat. Mm -hmm. So I look at this sort of the same way. I want to be, I want to promote the the green value of e-bikes. An e-bike will allow me to get to my, from my house to the Bay Trail without putting the bike on the back of my car. Mm -hmm. Because the motor would allow me to do that. It extends my range. It takes that last mile issue in terms of, commuting and transportation, it really addresses that. And we want to promote that concept. Um, I'm also a strong advocate, as Sean knows, for getting that gap in the uh, Bay Trail between Point Wilson and Point Pinole uh, closed. And that's a major project. But one of the justifications for which we can seek federal and state funding uh, for active transportation is that will allow people all along the San Pablo Bay shoreline to live in relatively modest, you know, comparison priced housing, for instance, Hercules, the high density waterfront housing that's being built. And you'll be able to commute to thousands of jobs at Atlas Road. And we we are are actively seeking funding with that point uh, in mind. And I'm just thinking that if we continue to prohibit e-bikes on that trail, that's gonna be hypocritical because we're trying to get funding for the trail and make the trail accessible to people who want to commute uh, to Atlas Road. And now you could, you know, with an e-bike, you can live all along that shoreline and commute to Atlas Road. So, you know, that's a concern I have. Anyway, I will um, like to see if there are people in the room that have request want to uh, address this. I know we have a couple of um, requests from, I think, Jim Hansen and Norman. Um, others that we're aware of? Yes, so we do have a couple on the Zoom that would like to speak, and I'll go in order for and the request. Anyone in the room? 
No. Nobody from the room. All right. Well, I'll leave it to you, Monica. Okay, perfect. We'll start off with Jim Hansen, please. Thank you, uh, uh, President Coffey and members of the board. Um, I just want to point out that you know, this kind of came across with no information. And we kind of just saw this actually yesterday. And um, I'm glad to hear there's discussion that's different from the uh, motion that's in the board packet. And as I understand it, or let me just say that as written in the packet, the motion is to approve, recommending approving, opening up trails to class one bikes. So it sounds like there's a little bit of a different discussion. I think it's a good one. Um, the, uh, your discussion brings up a lot of important points. Uh, for instance, green infrastructure, th the transportation on the paved trails is, as you know, very different than uh, uh, e-mountain bikes in our parks and natural areas. And to that fact, I think it does need to be looked at very carefully. You've seen maybe a tip of the iceberg a little bit today. There's a lot of information on impacts to wildlife both from mountain biking and hikers, except that as you know, as we've seen at Brioni's, there's now 30 miles of illegal trails going off the main fire roads that, that we're, we're all trying to figure out what to do, do about. Um, but as far as green infrastructure, the, the district has taken action that way in terms of commuting bikes on several of the trails already. The, um, I think the data is very important. And I think also I heard, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear about other park areas, but I think we ought to be polling our own residents, our own regional park residents about what their experiences are now um, and what their feelings are, even if they don't have uh, some interactions with uh, additional mountain biking. Because I do want to stress speaking from the hikers perspective, this is an increasing population also. We hear about popularity and if you go to each of the staging areas, you're gonna see a lot of cars without racks, people hiking, some of them with their dogs, families, kids, and so forth. I don't think we can forget that. And also the people with physical disabilities. Uh, I think that our equestrians, all of this needs to be included. And we have, as you know, asked for a public process, more transparency around the Bri Brioni's pilot. And I think this fits in here. And actually it kind of relates to the general idea of a, a trails plan because of all these pieces that are coming together without some overall guiding principles or even designs. And that's where a plan can come into use. So I'll just close by saying that uh, there's a lot more we need to know. Um, we need to have a conversation on this, including who the cohort, who the population is. I, I see different people when I go out to Brioni's or Pleasanton Ridge on uh, an e-bike. Um, and frankly, I don't know if it's one, two or three and I don't know if anybody can really tell. But anyway, thank you for the opportunity. It sounds like we would not be moving ahead with the motion as presented in the agenda packet that we you know, read. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't see in a, a motion in, in it this. It was a recommendation, sorry. It's a recommendation, yes. Which is a good way to you know launch an issue is I wanted to know in particular what management felt based on uh, our own experiences to date. And you know, in terms of pilot projects, we have pilot projects going on as we speak because <laughs> it's all of us who visit our parks are now observing uh, what's going on. Uh, and as part of the pilot project at Brioni's, we will be, you know, whether whether e-bikes are an express component of the pilot project or not, they are. They are a component of the bikes that are going to be subject to the pilot. Yeah, they're there. Uh, for Even the day you and I hiked out there, five of the seven bikes that passed us for e-bikes. Exactly. So we will be studying this, whether we like it or not. <laughs> Monica? Thank you. We'll go with Norman LaForce. Yeah, thank you very much. And I appreciate, uh, President Coffey, your 
clarifying comments because when this was first reviewed by myself and others, we thought this was a recommendation that was going to go to the full board and pass without any kind of public process. And uh, I appreciate the clarification now to make that uh, clear as to what's happening next. Um, and I appreciate that too, because uh, going back four years, uh, this has been something I've been calling for uh, with the park district is to try to get a handle on, on e-bikes and the issues related to e-bikes. Uh, I think any process needs to include stakeholder groups as Jim Hansen has talked about, user groups, uh, people adjacent to the parks, you know, get a, a good cross section of of uh, of the populace and and, pu and public opinion about this. Uh, that's going to be important. Uh, I do want to stress that I think there's going to be CEQA issues here, uh, since this is a discretionary action and uh, could have implications for environmental uh, issues, uh, and so that needs to be considered in any uh, discussion. Um, in terms of enforcement, I do think you need to look at enforcement. Uh, I don't think you can just say, well, we can't enforce it, so too bad. Uh, it's just going to happen. Uh, I guess, I, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, uh, I remember I went to Valparaiso, Chile some years ago, and, and there they do not enforce any, any action against anybody for graffiti. And the whole city is graffitied. It would be as if you went to Oakland and to the Park District headquarters and your entire building uh, was graffitied and all of Oakland's buildings were graffitied. It, it gets to be tiresome and worrisome at, at some point. And you want to have some kind of enforcement. And I think you are going to need to deal with enforcement over time uh, in, a, in a, a productive, constructive way. Um, and that leads to the issue about uh, e-bikes and access. Um, I think there's going to be a big issue that e-bikes are going to allow certain portion of bicycle riders who want a thrill experience to go into uphill areas that they would not normally go on or up uh, on a regular bike. And I'm talking about what's going to happen with Pleasanton Ridge and the adjacent properties there so they can go downhill. Um, and I think that needs to be looked at very carefully as also the issue of uh, what will be the impact on creating more rogue trails uh, in various parks. We've seen already the increase in Brioni's, not sure whether how much of that was due to e-bikes, but uh, that is going to need to be an issue that needs to be evaluated uh, in regards to this. And lastly, uh, touching on the Brioni's, I would hope then that with the pilot project for Brownies that the um, that e-bikes are looked at separated and distinguished from conventional bikes. My understanding at this point, at least from the last time I spoke with staff, was they were not going to try to distinguish between e-bikes and conventional bikes in the pilot project. Now, maybe I have that wrong, but I would hope that that would be, if that's still going to be the case, that be reconsidered and that the uh, uh, there'd be a way to evaluate uh, the two different types of bicycles. And I'll leave it at that. I think this is a good approach and appreciate the clarification as to how, the, how you're gonna go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Jim, let's talk about how, not, not here today, we're taking a lot of time, but um, what distinctions may be made between e-bikes and conventional bikes as part of that pilot. In other words, if you're keeping statistics or looking at, what happens at what point is there a difference to to note and to to test and so i think norman makes a good point maybe we should think about that and uh we yeah, follow part up. of that study will consider have hard counts where we're actually counting you know different users types of users by type and we could make that distinction uh and then when we do surveys we can also note uh the type of uh, if it's a bike ride or what type of bike there we can add that into that process and if i may as well the um we I've already given the instruction to public safety that on the enforcement side to take note of if there is an incident with a bicycle, whether it's an e-bike or a conventional bike. So we are already starting to uh, collect that data. All right. Good point. Thank you, Norman. Monica. Perfect. Next, we'll go with Rick Rickard. Thank you. Hello. Is he on a bike? I just got back from a ride. I'm still in my. <laughs> <laughs> I I put myself in the in the uh, 
Colin Coffee category, old guys on bikes <laughs> like their uh, e power. Uh, you just went mute, Rick. Uh -oh. We lost Rick. Rick, I, th I think uh, you, there he is. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Okay, my video went off. I don't know why, but you don't need to see me. Uh, I am primarily a road and utility rider. And, oh, there I am. Uh, so I'm, I'm not in the mountain bike category, but I do ride on roads and on paved trails, such as the Iron Horse and the... Uh, the Bay Trail, and uh, I'm riding what is technically an illegal bike. It's a class three bike. Although, as you pointed out, looking at it, you can't tell from looking at it whether it is or it isn't. I bought it for other features, for weight and other features. I The, the extra eight miles per hour that I can get the pedal assist, uh, I rarely use. Uh, when I'm riding on the trails, I often ride with no battery assist because I can just cruise along at 15 miles per hour um, and enjoy it. As, the, as Chief Traboro has been quoted as saying, he wants to enforce behavior, not equipment. And what, what I see when I'm out riding is the people who pass me are the ones on class two bikes, not pedaling, using their throttle and rolling down the trail at 20 miles an hour. Uh, because I'm riding as I would a non-electric bicycle and staying within the speed limits. But uh, those are the guys who are getting out ahead. So I, I just think that you need to think about the class two bikes and think primarily about behavior uh, more than the classification of the equipment. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Next, we will go with Beth Wurzberg. Thank you, Beth. You have three minutes. Beth? We will go back with Beth. Next, we will go with Scott Barthlebal. You have three minutes, thank you. Scott Barthlebal, Advocacy Director of Bicycle Trails Council of the East Bay. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you for uh, bringing this uh, to the executive committee for discussion. Um, I think this is great to see this starting to move forward. Um, I think as Tom Boss from um, Marin County Bicycle Coalition has, has said, the, the advantages far outweigh the, the downsides with, with e-bikes. Um, and th there are some downsides. Um, it gets more people out in the parks. There, there's uh, more traffic then, potentially more congestion. Um, on the counter side, as people have brought up, this is gonna get people into reaches of the parks that they wouldn't have been getting into. So it, it, it provides for some dispersion as well. Um, people aren't gonna wanna get stuck out miles away from a trailhead um, when their bike breaks down. If, if that happens to them, they're gonna take action so that it doesn't occur again. Um, so I, I don't think that's gonna be a big problem. Um, there was questions about um, gathering more data on the experience as, uh, President Coffey said, the experiment's running right now. Um, if there were severe problems, um, there, there would be reports of that. So I, I think by and large, that there aren't severe problems happening or Chief Chiaburo or the park supervisors would be reporting that. Um, not to say that there aren't impacts. Um, so I, I think there is data there. Um, it, it's not hard data, it's anecdotal. Um, but if it was severe, it, it would be known. Um, technology continues to change. Bikes are becoming quieter. Um, I don't know how that affects the specific frequencies that affect specific um, species, but the technology does continue to change rapidly at this point. Um, I, I strongly agree that it's primarily, predominantly an issue of behavior. 
Um, should we go out and lock up um, Rick Rickard? No, I don't think so. I, it, it's really, I think, more so an issue of changing our culture um, on getting along on the trails and respecting each other. Um, there are many ways to get out there and a lot of the means to do it, get down to responsible use and consideration for fellow trail users, whether it's the Bay Trail or whether it's a narrow multi-use trail. Um, and I think effort and dollars are much better spent to trying to change the trail culture rather than we don't want to share, we can't share to, it is possible to do this if we work at it. Um, slow and say hello is, is one tool there. Um, but my three minutes are used up and I thank you for the opportunity and thank you for moving this discussion forward. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and let Beth Wurzburg try again. Let's see if we can get her mic. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Beth, Hi. you have three minutes. Thank you. I'm a member of California Native Plant Society and I live in the East Bay. I love the East Bay Regional Park District Parks. Um, I agree with board member Rosario. I think there's time to collect more data and especially to get input from our East Bay Park users. I don't think that it's a decision that be considered without public input, without open discussion of the impact on other trail users and on the trails and parks themselves. Hey, Sandra, I, I just realized because you made that comment, that wonderful comment about um, uh, um, meetings, uh, like the Zoom. Hello? Who was that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'll continue. Um, yeah. We're sorry, that was something strange happening te <laughs> through the technology. Okay, so again, I just, I think this should be not considered without public input, open discussion, the impacts. We know there are going to be impacts, so I think we should study them, figure out what can be mitigated and what can't figure out where this might be an appropriate use and where it might not be, figure out how you'll budget and deal with fixing impacts, and that applies to bike users as well, and you know, do a seek review. Let's make an informed, thoughtful decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Next, we'll go with Kelly A. Kelly, you have three minutes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to uh, repeat, go back to what Mr. Barbaugh said about changing the culture. And I think uh, the, the biggest uh, aspect of culture that this is telling us about, kind of the, uh, the, the uh, Heisenberg uh, principle of culture, it's not the culture that's going out there in, in the trails or on the, on the, on the mountains. Uh, it's the culture that's going on in our legal system our culture of control, of uh, detailed pre prescription and proscription of uh, people's behavior and actions and and uh, limits of on their on their uh, freedom. Um, so we're hearing a lot today about uh, the data. You know, there's a lot of complacency today, assumptions that all, we we have more and data coming, more and more data coming in. Well, every day that somebody doesn't die and doesn't get killed or injured uh, on, uh, with, with these bikes, um, that is another day of data. But what's not, the data that's not happening, the data that's not being measured, uh, it's kind of a, 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 a feckless and, 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 uh, and, and sloppy data collection system, is uh, once upon a time, a couple of years ago, somebody went out and counted the e-bikes. Uh, there is no ongoing monitoring of the presence of e-bikes as a proportion of total bike use in terms of uh, going out and measuring it uh, on an ongoing basis, tracking it, collating it, analyzing it. That's not happening. We kind of uh, assuming it's happening. Everyone pretends like it's happening. It's not happening. There's no formal program to collect or analyze this kind of data. Uh, we all just assume it's growing and uh, that's that. But, uh, but uh, and then uh, the board and the public are also complacent in, in assuming that there is a legal and regulatory framework that is stable uh, for the regulation of e-bike use. That's the whole basis for the discussion today. In reality, the, the legal framework is fragile, it's brittle, it's arbitrary, it's capricious, and it, or maybe it's not right now, but it will be um, later in a few minutes, in, a few, in an hour from now, when we hear about modifying the provisions of Ordinance 38 
for administrative purposes. That will allow a staff to go out and clamp down on these e-bikes or, or loosen up all the restrictions or whatever. This is the kind of, um, you know, we have built a system where Ordinance 38 governs every single thing that a human can do uh, out in the parks. And then we are going to allow staff to modify it without tracking those changes at all, without coming to the board, without reporting, nothing. This is good. They can do this to uh, e-bikes too. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. And lastly, we'll go with Elizabeth Hudson. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> um, okay, hello. Um, thank you for, um, I agree with many of the comments that have been said tonight. I like the fact that more public information, uh, hopefully we, there will be more public information gathered about these changes and more studies done. I, I don't want to repeat a lot of the good things that have been said. So let me see if I can be brief here. Um, one of the things I'd like to be looked at is e-bikes continue to getting faster. They're getting easier to describe. They're going to add wheel, wheel evolve in. But I think that any um, talk about allowing e-bikes needs to order. Uh, okay, I, I'm back. Uh, um, all right, can you can you hear me? I so Elizabeth. Okay, you uh, might want to turn your video off. Okay, let me turn. Stop. Okay. All right. So I think we need to keep in mind that today's e-bike is not the same as next year's e-bike. Um, when e-bikes appeared and it, and it became known that you would not get a ticket for the e-bike, so it, essentially the users were free to use them. Um, it has emboldened other motorized vehicles to show up on the trails. Like uh, I've seen a BMX bike, I've seen a motorized skateboard, and I've seen things that I wasn't even sure what they were, but they had motors. And I think that gets back to enforcement again. If it's known the district doesn't have adequate resources, that encourages expansion of of other uses. Um, uh, and the problem with that is it increases the user conflicts. And when you stop, when you allow activities that increase user conflict, um, what happens, and I am an equestrian, so one of the things that is happening to equestrians is we are being scared off the trails. We don't feel like it's safe. And there's even a frustration with reporting things to the park district. Equestrians would call things in, they would send emails, there was a database they could contribute to, but there was never a response from the park district. There was never a change in behavior. Nothing ever happened. And so a number of the equestrians are a bit cynical about reporting things to the park district again. I would like that to change. I would like to make the park district feel like the equestrians are being heard. Um, okay, one of the observations about e-bikes was regarding bat nests, and I would like to remind people that there have already been e-bikes on the trail, so if the bat has moved 200 feet away, the bat may have already moved because of the e-bikes. It's not you know, you, ha you have to look at what's really happening in the park district. You can't just say the bat nest is away, it's 200 feet away. And so the e-bikes didn't have any, any impact. Um, I think one of the important messages, can I say one more? Preservation of the opportunity for tranquil um, nature and study is a really important um, mission of the park district. Please keep that in mind. That's why a lot of us are there. And am I out of time? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, can I say one more thing to sure. look if behavior over batteries is the issue and we want to get people into the parks to enjoy the parks. And I agree with both of those, but we need to think about if those are the two criteria, then when the e van that is perfectly quiet and can take 20 people down the fire road into the park for your, I don't know what, your picnic, your birthday party or whatever. I mean, what I think we need to look down the road. It's not just e-bikes. It's like, what is this opening it up to? So thank you for your consideration. And I'm delighted to, to think that there will be more discussion and opportunity for public input. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And if you or your colleagues ever feel you're not getting a response, contact your member of the board of directors. Thank you. Okay. Jim. Oh, we do have one more oh, request uh, for JS iPhone. You have three minutes. JS iPhone, would you like to speak on the item? All right, hearing nothing, go ahead, Jim. Um, Wanna close out? Sure. A uh, couple of things that were said is, is one is um, the world is changing. Um, it's more crowded out there. Uh, you've heard me talk about this before. Mm -hmm. Um, we have climate change impacts. Uh, we have new users, new user types, new technologies. And I think that we really, um, and we've, we're starting to do this. Uh, I know that I'm working with Sean and with Brian and with Lisa and, and a host of other people, and including operations. And we're starting to work, integrate with the trail user community to help us solve these problems. And I think this data, I heard data, that's definitely a critical element. And this is something I think we want to discuss with you at the trail study on the uh, the 2nd of December. We want to have, continue this conversation about where do we go in managing trails and, and addressing some of these issues. So I think that's the last thing I'll say on this. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to bring this item forward and talk about it. Thank you. I, I do worry about that session getting consumed by management issues rather than what we have done historically at those sessions, which is a focus on the projects and the capital projects in particular that involve trails and where they are at and where they're going. So I'll just leave that thought with you. Oh, we're definitely going to cover the capital trails, President Coffey. We have that as part of the agenda. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is Ordinance 38, item four, GM authority to amend, modify the Ordinance 38 provisions for administrative purposes. Okay, excuse me, I've got to find my other item here. All right, let me uh, screen share here. Okay, oops, that is, all right. Okay, once again, Jim O'Connor, Deputy General Manager, uh, presenting this next item in front of you. Um, this item is directly related to um, the Briones Trail uh, pilot study, which I think most of you have, have, are familiar with. Um, we need some uh, the ability to do some Ordinance 38 changes on a temporary basis for that pilot. And so therefore we are bringing this item forward, uh, but there are other uses uh, for an ordinance such as this. So let me just start really quickly. Where are we at currently? The current Ordinance 38, uh, section 200.3, gives the general manager to uh, make temporary uh, suspend or modify provisions of the ordinance for public health and safety reasons. Uh, the general manager then notifies the board within 30 days. And we have uh, you know, utilized this, uh, you know, when we have things like uh, slides uh, or fires or things like that, we, we often use this section to temporarily close or modify 
the use of parks. So this is pretty common um, uh, usage in the district now. Um, but we are looking at some new challenges as we go forward, as we just discussed. We have increased visitation. We have new recreational pursuits that we just had a long discussion about. Uh, we have climate change adaptation uh, issues that we're going to be facing into the future. And we're going to have to look at new ways of doing things and trying new things uh, as we adapt to this new world. So with that in mind, uh, and one of the best examples uh, is the Briones Trails uh, pilot project. The project is going to require implementation of temporary trail use rules uh, designed to test a variety of trail management strategies. Enforcement of these temporary rules will require an amendment to Ordinance 38 to allow district police to issue citations when educational approaches to gain compliance are unsuccessful. So if the pilot project essentially simply, if the pilot project is going to have any teeth in terms of uh, people complying with it, uh, so that we can test out these strategies that we have to have an ordinance behind that. Obviously, we'll always take that educational approach. It's pretty common for our police department to do that. Uh, but we do need in those cases where we do have to go beyond education, we have to have uh, an ordinance that they can enforce. So um, we had, I had extended discussions with legal about what was the approach to this. You know, we would have to modify potentially several sections of Ordinance 38. Um, but what we are proposing, uh, which would obviously have many applications into the future, is to have a more general uh, GM authority ordinance. So I'll just quickly read through this if people haven't had a chance to look at it. The general manager or the designee is authorized to issue rules and regulations to take other such actions as are necessary to preserve parklands, public health, safety, protect sensitive habitat, threatens or endangered species and distribute parkland resources and facilities among competing uses, including but not limited to the permitting or prohibition of certain activities uh, or restriction of them uh, at certain times to, and our locations. And of course, failure. and then it has the, um, the punitive section, which is failure to obey any directive issued by the general manager that the is pursuing the section would be a violation of this ordinance. So that's the A section and then uh, B section, whenever any activity is specifically permitted, restricted, prohibited, or specified parklands, or whenever their use of specified areas specifically prohibited, restricted, or prohibited, the general manager or designee shall cause signs to be posted or permits to be issued, notifying the public of such restrictions or prohibitions in conjunction um, with the posting of rules and regulations issued pursuant to this section. The district will publish applicable rules and regulations at least, one, uh, at least once in a newspaper published within the district. So, the intent here is uh, obviously the, the the driver here is the more immediate need for the Brioni's pilot project, but uh, an ordinance section such as this is pretty common in other agencies. Santa Clara County has one. I think uh, the other one I, I listed was uh, Sonoma County. So this is uh, allows the uh, general manager to make these um, decisions to adjust as we need as things go forward, whether they be climate related uh, resource protection issues uh, or, or general trail use issues such as the Brownies pilot project. So I'm gonna keep that short since we've we had a long issue last time. So we're open to any questions the, the committee may have. And we've got obviously a uh, district council uh, available to answer any questions and from the legal perspective. Yeah, I'll have a couple of questions, but I'll ask Dr Director Waspy. Take this down. Comments or questions? I, I think not at this point. I think this is probably a good thing. I think it, um, I don't suspect there's any um, abuse that would occur, especially with 30 days notice to the board of an action. If if for, for some reason the action, um, so what's that? You just tell the board and then the board, I assume with their, um, the authority that's the inline authority that they would say, uh, I reject this proposal, or four of the board members reject the proposal, then it wouldn't happen, right? Your current, current, current. Turned it off. The director Rossby answered your question. The current uh, proposed ordinance does not have the 30 day notice uh, provision like the 200.3 does. Okay, great. Thank you. But this this new ordinance will, or this new amendment, uh, will have a thirty day notice. It does not, as written. Uh, 
Oh, where did I where did I dream that one up? That was the uh, I had read I had read to you the prior existing ordinance two hundred point three, which has the thirty day board notification language. Okay, so what would the reasoning behind uh, eliminating that type of uh, notice? Um, it wasn't uh, in the original drafting, um, but obviously we could add something like that into the ordinance if the committee is recommending that. You are repealing the old language. No, we are not. This is actually an additional section. This is 200.5. So is the 30-day notice going to be in connection with other actions, not this one? Well, right now under 200.3, the existing public um, health and safety ordinance that does have a 30 day notification of the board by the general manager. Um, if the committee is suggesting that that could be added to the new section that we're proposing. Okay. Okay. It sounds like director Waspy is asking for that. <laughs> it, it certainly well, does. Yes. I would surely like some notification simply because, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some past history that I don't want to talk about, but uh, <laughs> thank you. We're the ones that are going to face the, uh, the scrutiny or the, the uh, turmoil. If, if something, uh, well, Stanford Avenue staging area is all I need to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Director Rosario. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm in agreement with uh, Director Waspy. Uh, and uh, and if we, uh, when we bring this bring this forward to the board, I'd like to see this not in consent, so that we can have a, a, a so the other board members can have a, a discussion. Because um, I think there might be some uh, anxiety about uh, usurping um, uh, board authority. So, or eroding our uh, our ability to uh, to have a say. So, um, but yeah, I think I could support this, especially with the uh, thirty day notice. Thank you. Thank you, Director. I know there's some uh, public comment out there on this one. So, if folks want to raise their hands, uh, we'll take public comment in a moment. My question is I don't is is arises from I don't see in this new language a time limitation and my understanding is the intent is that this uh allow the GM to take temporary measures to address these issues um and its genesis is from the pilot project it makes sense that the GM could have uh, uh, handled at administrative level uh the pilot pro project and that makes perfect sense to me. Um, but I don't see this having that kind of limitation. A pilot project is, after all, temporary. Um, and uh, ultimately, those the, the trail use out at Brioni's issues are going to have to be resolved by the board. So I'm, I'm concerned about the absence of that kind of language here. Yeah, the original intent of this specific ordinance was, you know, for the Bruno, it's probably certainly a limited period. We're going to do a two-year pilot. That, that's certainly uh, a limitation. That's our intention with that. Um, but we didn't include that language in the ordinance uh, because there may be some circumstances where um, where the, the general manager has to make a decision in order to protect um, a resource issue, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't include a temporary limit on it. Um, so that wasn't part of the original discussion. Yeah. And the whole point of this is there's some urgency to protect, protect a, a, some habitat. Correct. Uh, for instance. Or some other issue, um, use uh, conflict, et cetera, in the park. So the GM like ought to have that kind of authority, but maybe the issue eventually gets to the board. It's, the, it's addressing the urgency of the issue that makes sense to me with this authority. And I think general manager- You have an urgent situation and, and it's temporary. That makes sense. Yeah, it, uh, you're um, exactly correct, President Coffey. The, the, that's the intent behind this. And I know there is some anxiety with this language. It's definitely not to take away the board's uh, policymaking authority by any means. It's just so that we can have some flexibility to address things that are that are more urgent and certainly on this pilot. Um, we went back and forth around this idea of putting a time limit on it we ended up not putting it in there for your consideration be just because again the whole idea here is we want to have flexibility 
And so, you know, there's, we couldn't kind of come up with every single scenario in which we would, you know, need this. So having that report within the 30 days would actually enable you to then provide some, you know, direction if it is something where it is, you know, hey, this is really was a temporary thing and you're, you have some rogue general manager who is sitting in the the seat here who's decided to close a whole bunch of trails um the board would absolutely have that authority to to step in and provide that direction we just wanted to make sure we wouldn't have to come back every single time with an ordinance 38 amendment based off of putting in at this point which is feeling a little bit like an arbitrary time limit so we did consider that we knew that that was um, we didn't want this to be, you know, so broad and this is not meant to be changes that would be sitting there forever. So, you know, in the, we can, we can, um, certainly work with you all offline, um, to maybe come up with something before this comes to the full board that, that might be able to address that as yeah, well. I'm, I'm willing to send the language to the full board, but I would, um, favor having some revised language that expresses the urgent nature of the issue and that, uh, the, the you know, in in situations where it can or should go to the board ultimately then it will yeah. you know that's yeah. that's that's an expression i'd like to see okay okay we have uh, director rosario i just want uh, uh, to uh to uh, the general manager's point uh, when we created the um uh, resource protection area in uh, redwood along stream trail initially that project was uh we had a study se uh, session and, and ed education for a year. And it actually took three years to, to get it done, but uh, because, you know, people wanted more and more data, but uh, if, uh, eventually we got it done, but it did, it, it initially started as, as a pilot project and then, it, but it got extended to three years. So uh, sometimes you need that. Thank you. So Monica, I know did, uh, Jim asked for, uh an opportunity to speak on this matter. And then I see we have two others. Yes, so we had Jim and Norman uh, okay. previously ask us. Go ahead. We can go ahead and start with Jim Hansen, please. You have three minutes. Thank you, President Coffey and, and uh, board members Waspi and, and Rosario. This, um, this item is a, frankly a little confusing. The Impetus seems to be specifically a temporary situation at Brioni's. But then um, just reading the agenda material and the recommendation as presented, uh, it appears to be a very, very broad opening of Ordinance 38. And what the, frankly for us, the staff letter is missing is specific examples of justification that would go beyond uh, making some temporary changes, changes at Brioni's. Uh, for instance, the uh, one of the things that has been hard fought over time is having the public and the board be able to uh, look at any changes to trail use. Normally, that is uh, is not an emergency situation um, and not a particular burden. On, on the board and certainly an opportunity for the public. So the concern is what really specifically is becoming administrative that would no longer provide the public with an opportunity to know what's going on and comment on it and to speak to our, to our elected representatives about our, our beliefs on it. So um, if there's a specific change needed for Brioni's, well, that, that makes sense. But um, I think our feeling is this is not enough detail to really explain the justification and the application of a, a very broad and wide reaching opening of Ordinance 38, particularly, uh, and, I, and I hope that this is answered, uh, changes to trail use, where that's done administratively and taking, taken out of the public realm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next, we'll go with Norman LaForce. You have three minutes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, despite the clarifications, uh, I would urge you not to adopt this or move it forward. I think it needs a lot more work. Uh, I appreciate that the 
intent behind this was to deal with the Brioni's pilot project. That's what I suspected was the genesis of this. But then if that's the case, it should really be tailored to deal with that specific uh, project. Uh, because as it's worded, this is extremely broad. Um, and it uh, gives the general manager or a designee uh, the power to carry out all kinds of actions that may not be appropriate or uh, desired by uh, the board or the public. Uh, on the one hand, the way it's worded is a general manager could close off an entire park uh, for habitat protection and uh, say that nobody could enter the park, which would be uh, uh, not in anybody's intent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, according to the staff recommendation, it's to ensure equitable recreational access. So you could have a general manager who says, well, I don't think uh, horses, uh, equestrians are getting enough access and I'm going to permit uh, equestrian access to all kinds of trails and parks uh, that uh, are, are not appropriate or that anybody had even thought about. I don't mean to pick on equestrians, but um, that, that's the kind of situation you have where this is so broadly worded that it, you could have some real uh, uh, problems here with uh, somebody who wants to go rogue. Uh, and while nobody in this room I or on this uh, Zoom is, is in that intent, you never know with anybody uh, in, uh, in the future. Um, I, I would agree with uh, President Coffey that there needs to be some sort of temp time limit to uh, deal with this and some, some consideration of having this as a temporary measure if that's gonna go forward. But I really think it needs to be worded to be more specific in dealing with the particular issue that you have before you, which is the Rioni's pilot project. Uh, otherwise, this is uh, just so broadly worded that it could, it could mean anything to, to a future general manager. And as it's worded here, and as I understand the ordinance, 38, it, there doesn't seem to be any way to challenge uh, the decision by the, uh, by the general manager, either by the public or uh, by the board itself. So I think this needs a, a certain amount of work to make it workable. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Norman. Next, we'll go with Beth Wurzberg. Beth, you have three minutes. Hi, thank you. I'll be brief. I agree with what Mr. Nor what Mr. LaForce just said and that this is way too broadly written. When I read it, it sounded like this proposal would allow the GM to act unilaterally on major policy decisions, things that rightfully should have board and public input. For issues like general trail use or climate change, there's time to go to the board for input. Those aren't critical emergencies that require acting within a week or two. Further, board members are elected by the public and entrusted with representing the public's interest and stewarding the land. I would urge board members in general not to cede their responsibilities and power to any one individual. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And lastly, we'll go with Kelly A. Kelly, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, the reason I'm so sensitive to this, it's not just because I've, I've learned how to uh, pick through legal documents like a, like a lawyer, even though I'm not a lawyer, uh, but uh, it's because of uh, part of the experience we had just a couple of years ago here when the city of Fremont, the, the, uh, the city manager, his name was Mark Denae, and uh, the police chief uh, sent letters to the park district uh, declaring a public health emergency or taking advantage of a public health emergency and ordering you to close a park. Um, and uh, they did this uh, with, with full legal authority, kind of like martial law. And they, they were talking about health and public safety. And, um, you know, we have a military to protect us from getting, uh, you know, uh, invaded and, uh, and destroyed by our enemies uh, wherever they are. And, uh, and there are a lot of them, but, uh, and we also have police and we have Martin and, and they do martial law in those circumstances. And now we saw this state of public health emergency that the city of Fremont used uh, wrongly to, to shut down the main part of, of Mission Peak. It was the only park around 
that was that was shut down on a broad scale. And uh, you know, when you look at this ordinance 38, there already is a martial law provision, emergency provision, and it's got the 30 day reporting thing. And if you can't report in 30 days, then make it 60 days. And if you can't do 60 days, then make it 90 days. Uh, but uh, I, I, you know, you already have vast authority, and uh, the the thing is already pretty loose and gives uh, gives you uh, almost any, lets you do almost anything you want. Just report on what you're doing, and uh, eliminating that uh, will will put us in a situation where the public and the board of directors, but mainly the public, will will once again fall victim to people like the city manager of Fremont, Mr. Mark Dene. Let's all be very clear. That guy is uh, it was the one uh, behind this, um, who who uh, shut down Mission Peak, and we can't have that kind of martial law behavior happening ever again in America. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other hands, is there any comment, or I'll take it back to the committee. Jim, uh, President, Kai, I have no further. Oh, okay. What's the pleasure of the committee? Director Rosario? Yeah, I'm willing to uh, to uh, move this forward sure. with some amended language. Dennis? Well, I agree, I'm, I'm willing to move forward, but I think we need more discussion. I think we need more public discussion and, and I'm assuming that would be at the board meeting, but uh, you know, definitely some notification and some, um, and um, what, what, is our role as a board if if uh, uh, if if a general manager came and made uh, uh, some emergency uh, deal? What's proposed here, and uh, what's our recourse? Um, okay, I feel like we uh, well, I would be comfortable with the advancing the language by a motion uh, with all of you understanding that there are uh, there's a need for amendments as we've suggested and I'm getting nods from everyone. So uh, with that, would you like to make the motion? Sure, I would like to uh, make the motion with the uh, stipulation that uh, we know that the language is gonna be amended per our discussion today. And, uh, and then again, I'd like to recommend that this not go into consent, but it goes to us so the board can have full discussion. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Please call the roll. President Coffey? Aye. Director Rosario? Aye. And Director Waspy? Aye. Okay, item number five, seeking direction, consideration of a 5% increase in board member compensation. Council. Thank and you, President excuse me, Coffey. I wanted to go ahead and uh, give the opportunity if you guys wanted to go ahead and uh, go on break with the time. I know we've gone over the 2.30 mark or if you want to go ahead and proceed with the next agenda item. Uh, Is there like a quick break before we I do, I go should to the take next? Break. Yeah, let's take yeah. five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. And the meeting is live. Thank you. And we're back. And we were at item number five, consideration of board compensation increase. Council. All right. Thank you, President Coffey. So a couple of the upcoming items, this one included, are, are kind of annual items that we like to bring to you. This one is to consider um, providing pursuant to statute a 5% increase in board member compensation. And, and that's for the per diem for the uh, meetings that the board members attend each month. Currently, um, directors receive $115.50 for each compensable meeting, up to a maximum of 10 meetings per month. Uh, and 5% increase in that would result in a total compensation per day of 121.27 or 27 cents per meeting. Um, 
this is not something that we're asking this committee to take action on. However, in order to bring this to the full board for a vote, what we would need to do is publish a notice in, in the newspaper for two consecutive weeks and then have a public hearing at which the full board will vote on this item. So this is your opportunity, however, to discuss or to ask questions or anything that you would choose. I noticed the recommendation is gives us an option to defer it to 20, uh, 2023. What, what's the distinction between doing this now or deferring it? So if, if the committee or the full board decide they don't want to um, approve an increase, then you can bank the 5% until the next time that it's considered. You can consider it annually. So next, the next time you could consider it would be next year and it would be for a 10% increase, or you could say, we don't want a 10% increase. You want a 5% increase. You just can't go above the threshold of 5% each year. If we defer it, would it then go to November of next year? Yes. Uh, so we can't defer it to January or February. No. Well, you might be able to, if you haven't given yourself, if you haven't taken any action, then there isn't anything that says you have to do it a particular month, but you can only do it once a year. Okay, and why don't you handle the next item as well, since it's related? Um, sure. You don't want to um, just close this item out and take public comment? Well, is, you want to is item one? six dependent on what we do with item five? No. Oh, it isn't. Okay. I thought it was. Okay. So um, to the committee, any comments or questions on uh, item five and the uh, question of whether to initiate the process that takes the issue to the board now or wait another year. Director Waspy. Well, I'm, I, I would like to address this issue now. And, um, you know, I, I think that this is kind of a trivial deal. I mean, we don't, obviously we do this preamble all the time. We don't do it for the money. Uh, the money obviously doesn't even close to what we do in my opinion, um, but I think it is symbolic. And I, I always say, and you know, I, as I, I get old and crotchety and whatever I get, mm -hmm. I, I embrace some, and I don't know that anybody else considers it a moral deal, but I think that we always should take what our rank and file employees get. Uh, it's a tradition, the rank and flow, you know, it's as D will probably attest to, we work like dogs, fight like crazy for contracts, and we get whatever we get, and then management gets it automatically and takes that same amount. I think we should do the same, and it's 3%. Um, it's, it's my understanding that on April 1st, the um, Ask me locals will get 3%. I'm not sure what the police officers association will get, but uh, you know, it's just, I think we should take because we deserve a raise um, uh, just to keep up with the cost of living, but um, whatever the uh, ask me gets or, or rank and file people get. I agree with you hundred percent with the exception that we no longer just automatically give the same raise to management. We're now asking for comparable compensation uh, data to make sure what we give management is uh, justified. We, we started doing that a few years ago. Uh, Director Rosario. I'm happy either way. Um, yeah, I'm comfortable advancing yeah. it now and giving the issue to the full board. Uh, I've, you know, from the inception of this new statutory scheme for compensation, I've uh, advocated as Dennis does for uh, limiting increases to what our workforce has received in the comparable period, FYI. <laughs> so um, before we make a motion on the recommendation, uh, public comment. Yes, we have one hand raised on the chat. We have Kelly A. Kelly A, you have three minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Um... When people are talking about giving the same uh, same thing to uh, to the staff, um, it's not the same thing. You're giving the the, uh, the same rate of increase. Okay, so if, if they get an increase of two percent, then you get an increase two percent, whatever. Um, and what's the, and everybody thinks five percent is a nice round number nowadays, but inflation nowadays I think is actually a little bit higher than five percent now. So uh, you know the numbers that 
used to sound healthy, now don't don't sound very healthy. Uh, and for those of your staff who who quit your your uh, quit your workforce and came to work for the city of Fremont, some of them are actually getting a five percent increase, and that's five percent on top of a very 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 healthy uh, total compensation package, which is probably above the industry standards in uh, in terms of public safety personnel, uh, probably far above the the industry standards. Um, and so when we when 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 you talk about giving uh, giving more money to uh, the board of directors, you do need to look at the compar comparable salaries of directors, boards in other gov government agencies. So I went ahead and I remember a couple of a year or two or three ago, I did the study myself for you. And I, I still have it. Yeah, I looked at five or six or seven of them and I found that you were at the bottom and you were, you, in order to get up like into the middle range, you needed to the what double or triple your 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 compensation packages. Uh, you were you know a typical compensation I thought at that time was like twenty five thousand twenty thousand a year, and you were getting like seven thousand a year or something. Uh, it's it's ridiculous how little you pay, and it's not because some of your people don't need the money, but the ones who do need the money are not going to run for run for the, run for this job because they can't afford to work for free. Thanks. Uh, pardon me, is someone talking? Oh, shoot, I've lost you guys. We ought to develop the technology that the TV networks have where you flash on the screen technical difficulties <laughs> to allow your audience to know. A little construction I haven't <laughs> seen that in a long time, but I remember years ago on watching TV and then we are experiencing technical difficulties. Were, were you guys? Uh, 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 yeah, I, think I can hear you now if that helps. Uh, I was yeah, I was just, uh, this was on our end. No one on Zoom could hear us oh, okay. there. And I'm wondering whether we can get some something to flash on the screen. We are experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> so you folks would know it's not on your end. It was on our end. Yes. Yeah, so we apologize. We're looking for a motion yeah. and my, to, to uh, advance the... Uh, the uh, compensation issue, yes. Yeah, and if I can make a suggestion, um, I think that all uh, all that that we need to advance this is actually direction to um, publish the notice. Uh, the increase is anywhere up to five percent, and so you don't have to. You know, staff is not making a recommendation on what kind of an increase you might want to provide, um, but you have the authority once we publish a notice to go up to five percent. You don't have to make that decision today. Okay. 
and the five percent limitation is state law. Yeah, yeah. So okay. we couldn't we couldn't give ourselves right. a ten percent raise <laughs> unless we put it off another year. Great. So I'll make the motion that we proceed. So this is direction to go ahead and publish. Yes. Yes. And Dennis, would you second that? Second. Yes. It's been moved and seconded. Please call the roll. Perfect. President Coffey? Aye. Director Rosario? Aye. Director Waspy? Aye. Thank you, folks. So we go on to item six. Thank you, Council. President. Thank you, President Coffey. Item six is a related, um, somewhat related to compensation, but what this item does is it affirms um, the need for, for the Regional Park District Board of Directors um, for 10 compensable meetings per month. Again, um, state law limits for some special district board members, um, how, many mem how many meetings per month are actually compensable. Each year you have to make findings to determine that the need as a park district board member is for up to 10 meetings. So in the staff report, we've, we've prepared and attached a resolution updating the types of findings that you typically make um, in affirming the need for these 10 compensable meetings. So we're looking for a recommendation to take this item to the full board, board of directors, the need for 10 compensable meetings. Thank you. So as mundane as both these items seem, they're designed to force public discussion of compensation and of uh, the number of meetings that you should be compensated for, which affects your compensation. So it's just, it's a, um, a statutory scheme designed to force transparency on these issues. Director Rosario, any questions? Sorry, no questions. Director Waspy, any questions? No. Nor, nor do I have any <laughs> question on, on this one. Are there requests for public comment? I don't see any hands up. Um, I did have an email request from Kelly A to speak on this matter. Kelly, did you also want to speak on this matter? Uh, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. So uh, please call the roll. Right, President Coffey. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. You made it? No, we need a motion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking back to the last one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll please. make the motion. Director Rosario. Director Waspy. Second. Now call the roll. Now, <laughs> please. <laughs> Coffee. Thank you. Aye. Director Rosario. Aye. And Director Waspy. Aye. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. To item seven. Once again, board legal counsel on board operating guidelines. Thank you, um, President Coffee. Item number seven. Um, pertains to a review and update of the board operating guidelines. Um, as you'll recall, in um, 2020, uh, there was an ad hoc committee of the board established to review the guidelines and consider improvements to them that would hopefully result in updates and efficiencies um, to board procedures and meetings. The ad hoc committee was made up of Director Corbett and Director Rosario and then District Counsel Carol Victor. Um, after Carol Victor retired, I took her place on the ad hoc committee. Um, the ad hoc committee had conducted a review prior to me being um, employed by the district and they completed their review in September, 2021. Uh, they then resumed meeting along with myself in the fall of 2022 and um, have essentially come up with a number of proposals um, that are outlined in the red line as well as a chart. There are um, items that that staff have proposed as well. And so in this board item, we've tried to distinguish between items that are being recommended by the ad hoc committee for revision and items that are kind of outside of what the ad hoc committee was concerned with, but that staff recognized are things that need to be updated. Um, I do want to point out, um, it's very important to note that th with this particular revision, we are not claiming or proclaiming that the board um, operating guidelines are now you know, completely updated because there's a number of, of areas in which um, they need to be reviewed and further updated. It's just that these are more complex um, issues that we think merit kind of individualized attention. So 
I think that the recommendation is to proceed with this particular update with the intention that there will be board operating guideline updates being brought to the board in the future related especially to items from ASD and their particular processes as well as even things like board um, agenda reports. So with that, I don't know if any committee members have any questions, but we're staff is available to answer any of your questions. Well, we'd like to hear from Director Rosario on the work of his committee. Great. Yeah, um, uh, this was a long process and I really appreciate the uh, uh, Lynn's uh, patience. And uh, I know I, I delayed things somewhat by missing uh, a meeting that, <laughs> that that resulted in in, in uh, protract even even longer protract protraction of of our meetings, but uh, we finally got it done there. And like Lynn said, I wanted to say that this is a living document, and it's something that these are changes that we've proposed, and and I am hoping. Um, uh, and then, like Lynn said, there's there's still others that were a little more complex that we uh, should that are going to be brought up later, but I I'm hoping that uh, the board of directors. From here on out, uh, take a look at and review the board operating guidelines. From here on, because th there was a lot of changes in here that uh, were ten years old that needed to be changed. So uh, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be trying to keep uh, having maybe an annual or by or every other year uh, review by an ad hoc committee uh, just to bring up um, uh, these changes and. Um, I think there's there's quite a few changes, and uh, some of them are routine, uh, and and some are um, some are not. But uh, I just want to thank the, the members of the ad hoc committee, Director Corbett and Lynn, uh, for participating. This was a an, it's a very good exercise. So, with that, if there's any other qu questions, hopefully you had a chance to go through them. Any thoughts on the staff changes presented independent of your ad hoc committee? Uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we looked at uh, the, um, with those and uh, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a distinction between ad hoc and staff just to so, so that, uh, uh, that there was a distinction of a need, but we discussed those changes in, um, in the uh, proposed by staff, and we uh, we uh, there was consensus to bring them bring them forward, and with the intent intent that you know, like uh, when this comes before the board, you know, like I said, if there's going to be discussion, then there's going to be discussion. There could be amendments made at the board meeting. Okay, Director Waspy. Well, yeah, I thank you, Dee, and, and, and I'll thank Ellen also for all your hard work and staff's hard work on this. It's, it's an interesting document. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with everything. Um, I'll go a little deeper into it, but it, the one thing that I'm, I'm interested in, and I would like to see if we could, or what, what other people think about this, when under the section of bo open board meetings, uh, page 35, um, one thing I liked about this district and one thing I liked about other uh, districts I worked for that would suggest um, that, and you know, we, we, we all, with a, with a preamble to this, I mean, we, we love transparency. Transparency, we use that word all the time. We talk about transparency. We talk about um, our partners, our, our, our constituents, our, our stakeholders, everybody else. Uh, and under public comments, we're excluding one public comment period. I know maybe it's, uh, maybe we're only required by law to have one public comment period, but I hesitate to um, talk about the way we operate in closed session. Uh, sometimes we have really lengthy closed sessions um, that would send, tend to preclude or return to eliminate public comment. I know we always have it, but people schedule their days to have public comments. An example I would use is the union. If, if I wanted to come and speak before the board when I worked for the park district, I would have to take time off. And I didn't want to take off four hours for a board meeting. And I didn't want to schedule my public comments when I told my boss I was going to be off from 1 to 1.30. 
and how a lot of what happens to us a lot of times when we go over in a closed session and then reschedule it. Uh, or conversely, if a member of the public can't make it between the, you know, it's if we if we do if we are on time, it's probably around 1:15 when we get into uh, public comment. What if they can't be there at 1:15? I love the idea of do it, giving you the opportunity to speak in public on something that's not on the agenda at the start of the meeting and the end. I thought that's what made mm. us a really transparent, good, wonderful district that we claim that we are. So I, I sure wish you'd keep that in there. I don't think it's an inconvenience. I don't think anybody's gonna take advantage of it. Um, it just gives more people an opportunity to talk to us and, and uh, let us know how they feel about us. Where in the changes is, is that provision? He's referring to page 35 um, and under open board meetings, under public comments, there were some changes made to basically conform the board operating guidelines to current practice. Currently, at least as long as I've been here, we have not been providing a second comment period for items not on the agenda. And if I may- I, Okay, I see it. Yeah, we haven't been doing that, Dennis. Well, I think we, didn't we used to do that? Uh, I mean, I, I, it vanished along with the, and the I think it vanished, but I, I think we were doing that. I could, I've been a member of a couple boards. Well, but, but, so some, some of that might be my fault. I, I do recall suggesting that since public, there are public opportunities to speak on every agenda item, including on items not on the agenda at the beginning of the meeting, that there wasn't a need for a closing public comment period on items not on the agenda. And I, I'm not aware of other agencies that do that. Mm, I, I, um, well, I, I won't debate it here, but I, no, I, I'm, I'm all just... I'm suggesting is, I mean, we're eliminating this um, because currently it says that the current writing is that there are two. Yeah, I, I, in the that. past we did that. Yeah, so um, you know, I would argue the point where if uh, I doubt that anybody is going to speak, say the same thing twice and, and take up a bunch of time, I think just thinking we're giving people the opportunity that if they can't be there at one fifteen, could be there at four fifteen or three fifteen or whatever we close. I mean, it's just one more opportunity and one more piece of openness that I would I would push for. I would consider that an, a, fr a friendly amendment. <laughs> You see, I'm concerned. I think people would take it as an opportunity to get six minutes instead of three. So, you know, that, that's that's where I, I just differ. And, you know, the, especially if it's a real lengthy uh, meeting and there's issues that consume us from the public. So, I don't know. We can. We, how about we note that and then we bring it to the full board for discussion? Yeah. Well, let's have this discussion at the full board. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, it's a, a legit issue. Any public comment? Uh, Kelly actually emailed about this item. So I wanted to give him the chance to speak on this if you still want to. Kelly A? Um, no, thank you. thank you. All right, thank you. Then uh, I don't have any, oh, wait a minute. I did have a question. I'm moving too fast. Um, number seven on the ad hoc committee, adding deferred comp advisory committee to list of advisory committees. Is Does that reflect any thought or, or consideration on the fiduciary status of that committee or is are we resolving that issue by confirming that it's advisory? Uh President Coffey, currently the resolution that established the Deferred Comp Advisory Committee designated it as advisory. So um, there is there is still discussion occurring at the Deferred Compensation Committee level. I believe they brought up this topic at their last um, meeting about the fiduciary, um, where the fiduciary responsibility should lie. But adding them to the list of of board committees does not actually resolve that issue or, or pertain to it. It just recognizes oh, okay. that you 
as a board of directors have this as an advisory committee. Okay, okay. that was my question. It doesn't resolve that issue. Uh, and on staff proposals, number seven, revising threshold for GM uh, approval of budget transfers between funds and between divisions. I think that's a very good idea. The, a bunch of this stuff gets into our calendar. And I always scratch my head, why is, you know, why are we involved in this? So that that's fixing that. Uh, and then at the ledge committee, they discussed supporting legislation that would uh, uh, raise the threshold of general expenditures that don't need board approval, in other words, and that that isn't addressed here, but would be addressed if that legislation passed. Exactly. That's also something I strongly support. It's, so that the, there are issues that get on our agendas that involve really trivial contracts and, and shouldn't. To, the, the staff, just for the staff effort to prepare it for our board packet is Correct. a good enough reason to raise that threshold. Any other questions? Director Waspy? Colin, one, one more uh, point of clarification. Sure. On, on page 52, uh, compensation of board members, um, what is that, 9-A-1. Uh, um, can somebody define per diem for me? Council? Sure. I, per diem is is the flat rate of pay that you can get. It just means by per day is what it essentially is Latin for. So that's the flat rate of pay for board members per day. Okay. So yeah, that's what I thought. And so if you if you were to attend three meetings in one day, you still only get paid uh, the per diem. Okay, great. Because um, as I read it without knowing that um, we scratched out the maximum allowable conversation paid per meeting in any one day shall be. So that was just based on, <laughs> I should have known what per diem meant, right? Or everyone else should too. Yeah, I think the recommendation here is really just to um, take out uh, the actual numbers which change annually potentially and make it so that it doesn't have to be okay. updated each year. Excellent, thank you, sorry. Okay, that makes sense. And we don't have any public comment. So can we move to a motion? Sure, I just wanna make one. Um, uh, any questions about the board rotation of officers? What page is that, D? Uh, good question. It's <laughs> 30. Let me find it real quick. On page 12. Thank you. Yeah, page 12, let's see. Oh no, that's, um, where is that rotation? I think it's further up. I'm seeing it on page 12 and-, and um... He's not seeing it? No, it's not, uh, it's- uh, under the heading board officers and committees. Yeah, it's page, yeah, it's page 12 at the top. Right. A, right. officers, selections, and term. So there, there's a, a change here because uh, uh, it says selection of, of officers shall normally be held at the second, we change it to the second regular meeting in December of the year prior to the new term of office based on who is next on in the rotational list. The director at the top of the rotation shall become board president and the next in line shall become vice president. Why second instead of first? What was the thought? Uh, summer. The thought was uh, uh, there's a statute that says that uh, you have, uh, 
we have 30 days, was it 30 days? To take the oath of office? Yeah, you had, you had, to, you had to take your oath of office uh, uh, within 30 days of um, an election. I think it's the certification of certification, the Yeah, because the certification is actually uh, December 6th. So the first opportunity to, to, um, to get, uh, yeah, the first opportunity to-, to For returning, for in, returning incumbent members. When, when do um, newly electeds take office? They take the, the first a, Monday in the, of, of January. All right, so that change would have been to accommodate someone like myself who's gonna get certified at some point. In December. Yeah. So so this um, rotation policy would it would um, you would know who the incoming uh, electeds are? They would not yet be seated. You would be um, going through the rotational order based on those that have more seniority and have already been on the board. They they would fall in at the bottom of the queue. It, my understanding is this is basically just putting into writing what the practice has been right. through. Well, it's codifying the rotation yeah. that we historically right. tradition, I guess, yeah. as that you're dictating. I was just wondering why, I guess it really doesn't matter <laughs> whether it's first or second meeting in December is what I'm hearing, but there may be an advantage to the second meeting in terms of knowing who's going to be on the board. And then they yeah. have to take the oath of office prior to that. Uh, prior to their term beginning. Right. But, this, but okay. they can have the ceremony anytime, right? Okay. Yeah. So the, the, the real life issue with codifying the rotation is I have, well, I'll, I have worked for agencies in which the majority of the board did not want to rotate a member into the um, chair of the board yes, but because we... of competency issues. Yeah. I've worked for a couple of those agencies. And essentially, as part of the election of new officers, they had to amend their policy to not be rotational. <laughs> and so if, if that situation ever arises, you can deal with it that way. It's obviously a nasty situation to be in. And wouldn't expect it here, but it is a, a practical issue. Well, in our original draft, we kind of addressed that, mm -hmm. but we thought there's a lot of pros and cons to that. So we thought, I mean, it's still, we could still add it in uh, and, and it'd be at the um, discretion of the rest of the board. Yeah. It's always going to be at the discretion of the board. And yeah. I'm, and I'm comfortable with this agency uh, having, uh, yeah. having that in, in place. Our, in 85 years, I don't think we've had it. <laughs> <laughs> all right but you never know do you want to make the motion sure i'd love to yeah yeah i'd like to move that we uh recommend this uh to the board of directors thank you second it's been moved and seconded please call the roll president coffee aye director rosario aye director waspy aye okay there shall eventually be an end to this meeting we're coming up to item eight, public comments on matters not on the agenda. Any requests? That's usually Kelly. Any others aside from Kelly? Don't see any, don't see any in the room or the Zoom room. So go ahead. So go ahead with Kelly A. You have three minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, Park District just announced a $15 million project. It's been going on for years, but they announced that this $15 million project would permanently remove 50 free parking spaces on Paseo Padre near, near Coyote Hills uh, starting 10 days from now. And uh, the park visitors there are, uh, are alarmed. Uh, the city officials are suggesting that, quote, residents can make plans to enjoy another nearby park, end quote. In other words, it can go somewhere else. This raises questions about whether the park district and the city assign a high priority to parks and trails. Uh, Caltrans 
Caltrans, it's a state agency. They do uh, view their parks and highways and freeways as essential infrastructure. So they would never shut down lanes when they construct new roads and bridges. They would even build detour lanes as replacements to make sure that they don't lose lanes uh, while new, new stuff is getting built. Uh, Coyote Hills is one of the top two most parking constrained regional parks in the entire district. Data from the last two and a half years that the park district never looks at shows uh, that uh, Coyote Hills has a park, parking fee of $5 um, and they are shutting down three weekends a month. Another park, another park uh, that also shuts down three weekends a month is uh, Point Pinole but uh, they only charge $3 for parking over there. Um, Lake Chabot uh, has 200 free roadside parking spaces outside the park, and they're only shutting down 1.25 weekends a month, a lot less. And, um, and they have a lot of parking outside the park that's free right out there on that road. Um, these 50 parking spaces are about to close in 10 days. Uh, and people are very concerned about the loss of this much needed parking in Cody Hills. The city and the, and the board of directors of this park district should, should instruct your staff to immediately reconsider their administrative and managerial priorities, rethink and reprioritize Coyote Hills as an essential facility, uh, wor work proactively together to avoid losing 50 parking spaces and open up some existing street parking on Paseo Padre and Commerce Drive for use by park visitors on a permanent basis. Um, and anybody who's concerned about walking across the street, go visit Lake Chabot. They have a crosswalk there and the speed limit there is 35 or 50 miles an hour on that road. And uh, the speed limit on Paseo Padre is 40 miles an hour. And it's the same kind of a road. All you have to do is paint lines in the street, just like you did at Lake Chabot, and let people walk across the street on the crosswalk. Um, and I believe they already have a crosswalk at uh, Paseo Padre. So I don't see what the big worry is about having people cross the street. They do it every day at Lake Chabot, and they're not dying there every day. Although I'm not going to say that nobody's ever died there. I don't know about that. Thanks. Thank you. That brings us to item number nine, committee member comments. Director Rosario, any? Uh, again, uh, thank you to the staff, wonderful presentations to the point and lots of data to, uh, to um, support your, your, uh, your presentation. So uh, thank you very much. Really makes it easy for, for me anyway. Um, I just wanted, and special thanks to Lynn for, her patience with our with our with our ad hoc committee, um, and uh, as you see, there was a lot of stuff, and uh, it wasn't easy. And and she was able to uh, not only uh, take down everything she, we met, we talked about, but able be able to put it into a, in, uh, a legible uh, uh, chart. And uh, so, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, just an, as an aside, I had an opportunity to uh, the Arenda Library opened up, and they had a talk on the uh, building of the Caldecott Tunnel. And uh, uh, it was, it was, it was packed. They had to, they had to uh, expand the room, but I took the opportunity to buy a, a couple of the books and I'm going to give one to Sibley and one to, um, to um, uh, Brenda oh, wow. in, in archives because incredible story and wonderful pictures. And uh, one of the presenters was Mary McCosker, who was married to one of the McCoskers, but she, didn't live on the ranch, so, uh, but uh, it was something that, that I couldn't miss. And so I look forward to passing these books on. So thank you very much. Thank you, D. Director Waspy. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure always to come as a substitute and I look forward to being on the committee next year if I'm lucky enough. And um, it's great, it's a great committee. Executive committee is always the fun one. It's always the closest to what's happening and, and uh, always one of the most informative. So thank you all very much. Yeah, and congratulations on your election. You. Oh, was he elected? I didn't look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Landslide. There's, there's still um, little votes out there. <laughs> I, I didn't look up the, you know, I was on Contra Costa all night and it was just <laughs> nothing. Nothing triggered me to go look at Alameda. Congratulations, Dennis. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't have any additional comments, just to thank folks on uh, all the work going into the meeting. It felt very productive today. Thank you.
general manager no no comments but as uh on the agenda items other than to just say thank you to monica for filling in and uh and helping us run the meeting great job yeah, yeah. Well done. very well done. Uh, thank you <laughs> deputy general managers just happy to get just ha happy to get through the the meeting and special thanks to uh S Scott for hanging with us all afternoon. <laughs> Appreciate it. With that, we'll